You don't have a cool intro? I don't have nothing. Bro, we just flew through the night all yeah. the way to Ohio. <laughs> You've been bugging me for weeks and you don't have a cool I intro? I thought you would land the Blackhawk on the roof. I thought dude. you would have a jingle. A, 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 something. Can we get a jingle? A just can we get a chime? See, what you need to a get. gong? You need to get the Ooh, soundboard gong. with the sound effects for oh, your guests. Oh, yeah, that's dang. Get, get yourself one of those. Should we make our own jingle? That's like... That is key. You guys had a boy band for a while. Why don't you guys yeah. play one of them songs? Yeah, so we'll, we'll do one of those here in a bit. Do, do you have uh, any instruments here? We can, we can get some. Guys, we need some instruments. Just cymbals. Probably tubas uh, mainly. Yeah. Harmonica is his specialty. I actually. am He's big into harmonica. harmonica. Yeah, it turns out everybody's good at the harmonica. If you no, no, can no, just no. breathe. Some people are good. He is phenomenal. Yeah. He has phenomenal. a natural gift for harmonica. He we just have found footage. out. We have footage of this. We'll send it your way. And it's, then you can decide. Turns out it's my only talent. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's all you got. Nothing else. That's all you need, dude. Guys, welcome to the podcast. We got the Diesel Bros in the house, which is crazy. You guys flew on a red eye we did. all night. Yep. But I had like those pods where you're kind of like laid down like a bunch of hot dogs in there. But you had to stop. We did have to stop in Detroit, which was not ideal. That, um, I just needed to justify my red eyes, you know? I yeah. always have red eyes anyway, so I needed to. But it was a dedicated, dedicated Absolutely, trip. man. We made it happen. So freaking honored to have Listen, you guys here. That was my first time in those pods. Dude, life changing. It actually, I'm, that's I'm a telling funny you, story. Life changing. He's been wanting to fly in the lay flat seats forever. Yeah. Right. And it just, it just never worked out. So last night I'm booking his flight. Normally he books the flight. Well, I turned the tables because I took this very seriously for you, right? I booked the flights <laughs> this time around. <laughs> I and actually already had booked my he flight. He booked too. his flight. And, he, and normally, and I'm in this, the back. This sounds like a dick move, but we book first class or we're diamond or whatever. And he's usually, you know, premium co economy comfort. He's, just right back. Yep. Just behind the curtain. Because you don't normally <laughs> buy the whole rows crew. Back. Behind the food. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, uh, I booked his flight, got him in first class with us, and uh, it had the pod seats. And I didn't really think much of it. I was excited to get some rest. Turns out it's his first time and he's been wanting to try them out for quite some time. He was so damn excited that he couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep. That happens. I didn't sleep, man. I was just pumped with my friends like a sleepover. Up all night hitting different recline buttons. Dude, on the it's dangerous getting better flights. Bro. Mm -hmm. So here's what here's what happened to us and how we fell into that danger zone was we we on YouTube there wasn't a lot of overhead. So you you needed write-offs. Yeah. So the account was like, spend money on trips when you fly. So we're like, all right, that adds up. You start in first class, then you start in those pods, and then you can't go back. No, you, you cannot no go back. Sounds like such a jerk thing to talk about, but like Bro. Dude, I'll, I'll let you know you. on the way back we, how no, it is going just back because I'll be it. in the back we on had, the way. We had the sweet pods all the way to Detroit and then turns out to get to Columbus, there's no pods. There's barely like right. bus seats. Yep. We were in 18D and E and B <laughs> back by the bathroom and I have not sat for This snap. sounds very like pompous, but I just don't do it. Like I, I will spend any amount of money to be, to not have restless legs. Yeah. You know, kicking and, around. And that happens when you, like, you're fine until you experience it. Yep. Then, it's then you're broken over. forever. It's like it's like flying helicopters, dude. It is very similar to flying. Well, I got to get in my car and drive. Yeah, no. Oh, drive where? Oh <laughs> God, I had to drive here to. Yeah, no, it's disgusting. Yeah. The thing now is which helicopter are we taking? Honestly, that's, when that's you, the conversation when, when we have now. Is which, roads. Which, which one are we for taking? Peasants. <laughs> oh jeez. Yeah, jeez. Jeez. <laughs> <OP. laughs> Clip it. That was a good <laughs> podcast, guys. Well, that's the end of the show. Speaking of speaking of roads, um, so on the way in here. Ohio, right? This yeah. is my first. I've been to pretty much every state. I don't think I've been to Ohio, right? No, we, we haven't welcome. been here. Well, I didn't know whether we were driving into a Disney movie set or like an M Night Shyamalan movie. It felt like a little bit of both. It was like really enchanting, but at the same time too enchanting. Like there's some, so for example, something very strange stood out <laughs> coming through town. Just nobody's out, nobody's about, nobody's doing anything. Uh, Next thing you know, a couple of old timers, seventy five year old dudes. Just, uh, you know, the guys that you would see at the, the pool doing aerobics or something, they're out there playing the meanest game of horse you've ever seen yeah. with impeccable oh. form, dude. Windbreakers and all. For sure. It was, it was a Bird. scheduled basketball date. Is Listen, what I'm saying. those like, two guys. Do you know them? They are out there every day. Hooping it up. Every day. It was awesome. Actually, if they're not out there, I'm worried something happens. It was inspirational. Dude, it's awesome. Because yeah. the, the dedication, like they were, they the form was what I really got me. As we drove by, out of a corner of our, we see a swoosh. Yeah. And it's like, oh, they don't miss. You bro. can hear oh, those, kids, those kids are getting down. Echo through the canyon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know you're, you're, you're here when I know the two guys you're talking about. That's yeah. how small this area is. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the only two people we saw in the Really nice so, windbreaker, yeah. too. Great windbreaker. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the swoosh was from the, the swoosh or from the windbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> those two guys are about it. That's all we got. Well, here. that's the that's a yeah. lot. You should you be got, proud of that. You got one cool dude that's cruising around in like a mid '90s Subaru Outback with a hood stack, and a, and we a did see Mr. Ohio on the way here. Yeah. Ohio. Yeah, I think he was awesome. headed to the pageant. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. We were driving along, minding our own business, um, on your terrible roads. By here. the way, the potholes are just like, dude, 
out of control. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, look in the, look behind us. I'm pretty sure there's a Subaru with a hood stack, a, a snorkel, a light bar, and what else did the he tractor have? Flapper. A winch. He had the, uh, like he had a winch flapper. and he had I don't the, know this car. Yeah, it's it's mayor. Mayor. I think well, will. Maybe you, an out of towner dude. Yeah. He, you probably think it's a plane when he's going by because it was loud. So yeah, he was just, and then, and then we got in the right lane for him to pass and you could hear him passing for like 45 minutes. <laughs> just wrapped out. And then he comes by us and he's, not really moving very fast, but hood hood stack just but looking sweet, flap to the sky oh, yeah. and sweet. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I want to. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off, but I need to point out because I know there's people watching right now. That's like, where's Brittany? All right, my people. wife, dude. Yeah, man. Like this is it's a, it's a bummer. This she's is a tough like one. Here, right? She's subject right now. Yeah, she's hmm. usually beside me or yeah. here because I like I like being at a yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, she was not able to make it here at this table today. Originally, she had planned on being part Dude, of the conversation. You should have seen her smile sitting here. Yeah, she's know, ready. I she's know. mic checking, and then yeah. hands shows up. I have up. enough hate online as it is, bro. <laughs> hey, okay. oh, you know what? In fact, if you can insert any clips, you should insert some clips with the garbage can fiasco. Nope. <laughs> no, keep going. What, what were you saying? Keep going. Well, <laughs> keep going. Hi, honey. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> but look how comfortable she is now. She I looks wanted to way just happier. sit back. I wanted to sit back and watch. She and then looks- you put this. Mike in my face. If I had to, an iPhone in front of me. <laughs> you know, ridiculousness, Chanel West Coast, where she yeah. sits over and just reacts. That's your job today. Just, you just, just have okay. to sit back, be awesome, and make us all feel dumb. Can you just high pitch laugh for me real quick, and then we can dub that over everything we're talking no, about? No, I will not. No? <laughs> was, oh, who did that? Was that, <laughs> that, was, me. that, that was really that was good. Me. Was that a laugh track? And, and, and then each time we say something that might be funny, we'll throw that in. They won't know it's not you laughing. No, Just so you know, no. Brittany, your seat is I'm still here. available. If, if at any time you need tagged in, because he would really it. love to go sit under that blanket. We <laughs> He's actually freezing. Sh- should have done the show on that couch. I don't know we why could we're have all, this. We could have all got. We on could that. still. Yeah, we technically our cameras are kind of. Oh come on! Set don't up do this to him. The problem is, bro, you're so stuck in this mentality of everything's <laughs> got to be perfect because you're you're very you're very high uh, high production, high quality. Everything you do is is that's your, what you're known for, right? You do everything to, I don't, the, to the max. I do not think that's what I'm known I for. I think it is, <laughs> and, it, and this place is far from perfect. Well, you would never know it, honey. I love you. I love you too. I, I didn't I didn't choose this. I was looking forward to having a conversation <laughs> with you, but I guess we can. T- <laughs> the more you guys talk about it, the, the worse I feel. Just so we're clear. If you could I'm just put like a dark here. wig on, yeah. then we could probably get through us. the show. I, I, I'm out of words. I guess Trust just drop me. a comment below and let us know how you feel about <laughs> hands. <taking laughs> Does hands <laughs> Please do not. Does hands take Please Brit's spot in future episodes? No. I'll, I'll Honestly, the though, hey, here's the thing, though. He gets a lot of hate, but he's the most loved guy around. He is. Like, as soon as, by the end of the day, you're not going to give a damn about us. You are going to be more interested in Hansel. Because he's just a lovable guy. It takes a minute. I mean, you got to get over the whole the it sounds the like to the couch thing. And <laughs> the kind of people that are hated. <laughs> they are, yeah. yeah. yeah they, they. No, she's, she'd probably much rather be right there. I know that. Look at that smile. I just love that. You already cut my setup. mic off. We got the, we got the phone. Oh. <laughs> All right. Here's why I'm super pumped that you're here. Number one, I was just doing Logan Paul's podcast, um, Impulsive. Number one podcast in the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and. Nice. He on that show we happened to be talking about helicopters and he was like, "Do you know uh, Dave Sparks?" Yeah, and I'm like, "Nah, we've never met, we've never done anything." He's like, "Dude, you gotta do, you gotta do something. You guys would be best friends." And before that episode even came out, you and I were hanging out. It was weird. Is that weird, bro? It goes even further than that though. So Ethan Roberts, you know Nitro Circus, yeah, he's been saying for like six months. He's like, Hey Roman, uh, I want to get you guys together. We want to do something. So all this, all these roads have been kind of converging. And then we meet at Bristol and obviously, you know, we watch you do just the sickest burnout ever. And I'm like, this is our guy. Like this is, this, this, we should be bros. So I knew that we should be bros even before Logan Paul, number one podcast in the world yeah. said that we should be bros. And, uh, he, he wasn't wrong. We kicked, we, we hit it off. Yeah. I love that law of attraction, dude. 100%. Like literally yeah. what's the odds? Not good. Not good. No, they're not good. And then we're just chilling. And the fact that there's this whole, it's not just like we met, like yeah. we're helicopters. It's, there's so much going on that is very symbiotic with the relationship here. Yeah. That, uh, it's not a coincidence. It's very cool. Do we get into any of that? Uh, Do we blow some minds today? Yeah, I think, I think we're blowing minds right now. We got to blow some minds? But yeah. <laughs> just pace yourself. The <laughs> minds will be blown. This love thought, relationship going yeah. on here. Sparks It'll flying. transfer to you here in a minute. <laughs> I know the way he looks into my eyes when Bro, we talk. It's, it's like, so, do you know who Kip Moore is? Country artist. One of my favorites. He's a, he's a, he's a great artist. Him and I are bros. Like, we, we're buddies. 
I have him pick him up for a family event that we had him come play a private show for us this summer. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking I get to hang out with Kit, be buddy, buddy. Hans picks him up from the airport and does the assistant thing, right? Because Hans is technically my assistant, but he's also a partner. And apparently now he's a co-host on a podcast. Yeah, he's the real deal. Um, Dude, to your Kip podcast. didn't even want to talk to me at the end of the trip. He was just hanging out like, but like they had a secret handshake. He freaking stole Kip, Listen, bro. He yeah, stole man. Kip. Somebody from me. had to. And like, I, I don't, to. I don't, I don't fanboy over anybody. Like, yeah. and I don't fanboy over Kip, but he's somebody that I admire and look up to. There's very few people that I'm like, I'd like to meet that person and hang out with them. Yeah, you know, everybody's got their like guy. They, or you know, fans have their people. Yeah, I don't really have those people that I look up to that much. Just a couple, and hands stolen. That's more. Of I had story. to. I had to. We we went to his concert like two weeks ago in Salt Lake. This is like six months after we hung out with him over the summer. Walk in, Kip like gives me like a, kind of like a half a handshake. He's like, what's up, bro? He gives hands like an upside down hug. Like, and I don't take hugs. hugs. Yeah. I'm not a hugger. It was not a hugger. Another we five minutes, we're going to be shooting the show like this. <laughs> yeah, we will, for sure. <laughs> what's up, hands? Yeah, All 19 cameras on that guy. So yeah. listen, listen, back to your podcast with Logan though. You talked about, and you asked Logan if Dave was in military and that's how he got into flying. God, I felt so dumb after that, dude. Yeah, but I felt so, so go sick. Ahead and clarify, was it a compliment? Dave? Bro, absolutely. Because no, yeah, okay, yeah, he, was, he, was, he was getting pretty... Because you post the clip, I'm like, God, uh, I feel so nah, stupid. Man, I, was, I, I, I replayed that clip. I played on the way here. Nice. That's that's a, it was a good morning. thing. It was a good thing. Though. Yeah, it's a motivation. No, I, I mean, here's the thing. Um, funny story about Logan and his guys. You know, we had them out last winter to Utah um, because, you know, we wanted to get together and do some filming and stuff. And Jake is very action related and so is logan but jake is just like get me in any machine any environment let's go do some crazy stuff yeah. so all right jake it's your birthday let's do it so we have him up to a cabin up in um uh northern utah for like this big winter fiasco for jake's birthday and uh, we picked them up at a private airport in a bunch of helicopters when we get there i'm flying my helicopter which my current helicopter is like a military helicopter it's 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 very rugged and like it's like um Cletus's. I sold Cletus my red. It's a 105. Actually. Yeah, the 105. <laughs> and uh, so the other helicopters there were like really nice, like VIP, like uh, A Star, uh, EC 130. We had um, like six helicopters. So Logan and Jake and their whole entourage kind of pile in these different helicopters and we fly up to the cabin and uh, <laughs> we get there and Logan and Jake's just like, oh, like that. We don't, we don't like the helicopters. I'm like, why? What's wrong? They're like, I don't know. It just wasn't, we weren't comfortable. We didn't feel safe. Like that. We just don't love them that much. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they're like, but our our guys flew with you, and they said you like flew upside down, and like they, <laughs> they felt really. I have this picture of of Jake's main security guy, and he gets in the helicopter when we first pick him all up, and he's just just pissed. just pissed, just not having it. Like it's been a long night. Everybody, he's herding cats, right? Yeah, sitting in the back of the helicopter, just like this, frumple up against, mm -hmm. just. And then I, I could tell, I you know, I could see the game he was playing, so I was like, all right. Let's, uh, you know, play with them a little bit. So we're like 10 minutes into the flight and I just roll the helicopter. I mean, it wasn't upside down, yeah. according to the FAA, <laughs> but it was a pretty good roll. And instantly he just lit up. And for the remainder of that hour long flight was just smiling and giggling <laughs> like a little kid. So he was, so back up a little bit. When that happened, Jake and Logan and then we're all filming in this helicopter. We go like this. Jake and Logan think they just watched everybody die in my helicopter. Literally, like oh they were, they God. got to the cabin, they were like shook up. So they're like having a rough flight, not smooth in their helicopter. They just thought we died, so they're just a little bit, you know, leery. And they're like, "Dude, like, is, we've seen you fly. Is there any chance, like, maybe we could fly back with you?" I'm like, "Why do you want to fly back with me? You saw like I, I roughed your guys up." And they're like, "Yeah, but he said he felt so safe." So we take Logan, Jake, and their girls, all their baggage, and stuff them in the back of my helicopter, which is fairly tight for passengers, and. uh, they apparently just have the time of their life. It's, I guess it's the, uh, I don't know what the experience was that was different, but they landed and they're like, this is the greatest thing ever. We love helicopters. And uh, I think it's, it's you got to be a little bit aggressive and scare them into liking it rather than the other pilots are very good pilots, but they fly just a little too normal, I think. Mm. And they maybe thought that they were underskilled. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but Logan. I think uh, you made them thankful to be alive. Probably that was yeah. that's where the joy was. Coming yeah, from. yeah. They they landed. Yeah. We're, we're just happy to be we're alive. alive. But they loved it. I mean, they. Uh, Greg was saying he wants to buy a helicopter. Logan's dad. So it was a good experience. It went from they were very nervous to they had a great time. Dude, th they've got to be one of the greatest things ever invented. Helicopters. Yes, I thought you were going to say the Pauls. <laughs> <laughs> the Paul oh. brothers are right there. They're up there. Not with helicopters though. Dude, I'm so addicted. Like I think they're the greatest thing. Well, it's interesting because. Ever since the Kobe thing, a lot of people are just down on helicopters. They think that they just fall out of the sky, right? Yeah. My whole goal is to show people how you know how safe they are and how they function. Once you understand a helicopter actually works, 
you love it and you understand it and you respect it um, because they don't just fall out of the sky. They're extremely safe. They're safer than airplanes. Um, but the whole Kobe thing is going to take a while for people to get over. But yes, they are literally. So for me, I get to do a lot of cool stuff, drive monster trucks, yeah. drive any you know range of different vehicles, go cool places, hang out with cool people. Nothing compares to a helicopter. It's the greatest thing. Never gets old. It's the greatest thing. And I have, I have videos that date back, I don't know, eight years of me saying, mark my words, one day I'm going to, be a helicopter pilot. Yeah. I'm gonna own a helicopter. Yep. And uh, now I'm in it. Yeah. I'm in it. Bought a helicopter. I'm I'm less than 30 hours into my training. Like Cruising 26 along. hours. I yeah. love it though. But you're all in and you're doing the I'm right all way. in. I think when you buy a helicopter, you're all in. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the way I did it. Yeah. So that's how I was advised to do yeah, it. That's the only way to do yeah. it. it. Well, it's not the only way to do it. But the problem is the other way is you use somebody else's helicopter, or you go to a flight school, and then you're limited on helicopter availability. And sometimes it's not the same helicopter, the way you're doing it. Is the same way I did it. And it's not the way everybody can do it, right? It takes it takes a little bit yeah. of capital to do it. Yeah. I didn't have a ton, a ton of money when I bought my first helicopter, but I just knew that I had to have it. So I bought it, literally flew to um, Tennessee and met with an uh, instructor. And he was the guy that I hired to fly home with me. And I said, hey, so basically as soon as we get in the helicopter and start flying home, you're training me. And he's like, okay, perfect. We fly home. It's like a two-day flight, kind of stopping, hanging out. Uh, by the time we landed, he signed me off. He's like, all right, you're good to go. He's like, go solo and then go take your test. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was got a lot of flight time concentrated in a very short period of time. Holy crap. And uh, I, I'm, I have a knack for operating machines and equipment. So it came to me a little bit yeah. more naturally. But yeah, it was, I was signed off in like two days. That's awesome. Yeah, the cool. only thing that's been unnatural at the start was the uh, pedals were opposite for me. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know if it's from skid steers. I don't know what. Yeah. But now it's fine. But well, wait till you get in a different helicopter that has opposite pedals. <laughs> right. So Saturday or a couple of days ago, I was flying an A Star and my 105 opposite pedals. So left power pedal on the 105, right power pedal on the A Star. It is a weird, weird. That would screw with me so yeah, bad as a it, new pilot. It takes it takes some yeah. uh, thinking for sure. Yeah, dude, the 105 is so awesome. It's the greatest helicopter ever. That's it's what I twin I, engine, fully rigid rotor system. When I was learning how to fly, the guy that was, that was teaching me how to fly the 105, we flew to. So Kennecott Copper um, is uh, it's Rio Tinto now. It's one of the largest open pit mines in the world in Utah. It's like one of the seven things you can see from space or something. It's huge. So he's like, let's fly up to the copper mine. I was like, okay, let's fly through there. It was a really windy day. The wind was doing like this vortex thing through there. In most helicopters, you don't fly into turbulence. And he's like, yeah, just fly right in there. I'm like, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> doing that. Like, are you sure? He's like, listen, there's no helicopter in the world or there's no aircraft in the world that's safer to fly through turbulence than this helicopter. Hmm. And we flew right into it and we were getting gusted and tossed around. And the reason why it's safe is because the rotor blades are rigid. So mm -hmm. they can't flap and hit the helicopter body. You don't get yeah. mass bumping. You don't, you don't get any of those issues that you would have. Like I wouldn't do that in a Robinson right. or a Jet Ranger. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they're awesome. Twin engine. I feel comfortable flying my family 10 feet over the water and knowing that if I lose an engine, we're good. I've actually lost an engine flying and no big deal. Just keep flying. What's he's never like? told me that before. What's he's that never, like? Just so we're clear, he's never, he's never mentioned that ever. So I think my flying with Dave is over. Uh, losing an engine in a 105 is like just is like you're just flying. Just hmm. keep on flying. We've had some close calls um, in helicopters. Yeah, for the people that don't give a rip about helicopters, we're probably boring them. What's the what's some of the shadiest moments in your helicopter? Oh, you want to talk about them? <clears throat> Something scary. You tell me. Which one you want to talk about? <laughs> Which one are you yeah, legally yeah. allowed to talk yeah, about? Is well, the question. Uh, Shady has been in the back seat without a headset, so I can't see. All I see is his body language. And it's, it's hold on, tell him to paint the picture here. <laughs> it's like midnight in North Carolina. Oh, I was painting the other picture. You paint that one. Which one were you painting? Morgan. Morgan. The city of Morgan, the left hand turn. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that one. That one was rough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that one was worse than. We, we, we've had, we, I mean, as a, as a helicopter pilot, especially in mountain terrain and, and, and lots of people in the helicopter, you run into situations where you are managing power right on the limit. Mm -hmm. It's right where they're okay to be, but you get a weird gust of wind or something. Long story short, um, our buddy in North Carolina got a helicopter. He wanted to get in it. It was a long ranger, nice helicopter, a little bit heavy, but uh, we threw us, our buddy, the pilot or that owned it, that was student pilot, I think at the time. So I was pilot in control or pilot in command, and then a big Polynesian buddy of ours in the back. Anyways, we go to fly, we go to land at this lake, his lake house. It's pitch black, flying over a lake in terrain that I've never flown in. And um, in a helicopter, you get what's called a LTE, yep. right? Loss of tail rotor. And uh, it happens a lot to some of these older long ranger bell helicopters. So we're going, we're going in for landing, can't really tell where the wind is. And I'm kind of like, I'm on the controls with him, but he's also kind of like, keeps grabbing them from me and it's 
that's like a big no-no, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I have the controls, positive transfer controls is like a must. He keeps on kind of grabbing it. I grab it, grab it, grab it. Next thing you know, we're going into this hole, which is the black LZ of his house. There's trees and lake around us. And again, it's a really dark night. You can't see anything. We start spinning. Helicopter starts doing, it loses tail rotor authority. Yeah. And uh, when that happens, you have like a split second to react. And he grabs like, like the control so tight. And he's like, just panicking, just complete, like full blown blacking out. So I just reach over and I like slap him on the chest. I'm like, hey, I got this. And I grab <laughs> it and, and I fortunately was able to fly us out of it. And like, it was like in the movies, dude, we flew down like, <laughs> When you're spinning, the only way to not spin anymore is to dive for airspeed because yep. the the you know the, the wind on the airframe will basically straighten it out like a weather vane. Dive down below these trees, like ten feet above the lake level. Best part about this whole thing, though, is as it's happening, Dave and the, the our big Polynesian buddy are in the back seat. We start spinning, <laughs> and the, our Polynesian buddy uh, Lala just freaking out, just not has no idea what's going on. He can't really hear us. He looks over, and Dave is just casually. Pulling up his boots <laughs> as the helicopter's spinning, just getting ready for whatever's about to come. Just zip up the jacket and we're going in the drink. Hearing, the, hearing Lala tell the story is the greatest thing you've ever heard because God. he's like telling it from his POV. He has no idea how helicopters work or what's going on or why we're spinning out of control, why I'm punching the other pilot. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that we, we did a full 720. We're able to spin out of it, fly out of it, and, and saved it. That's that's one of, of many. We've had a few. Great piloting. What about the freaking terrifying? Can we talk about the, the runway incident? Uh, with the forklift or no? <laughs> nope. Okay. Nope. There, there are some All right. My you just story don't... is uh, off camera. I love subject. forklifts. Dude, yeah. He was, was really flying sad. a forklift. Yeah. It was cool. I'll yeah. tell you after. We, we've had the, uh, I've been flying for a long time. And yeah. when you fly different helicopters for a long time and in different situations with my personality, you run into situations, but we're all good. No, no, no wrecks, no accidents, no incidents. We've we've recovered some for some gnarly stuff, and now I have a Blackhawk on the way, dude. Yeah, we gotta talk. I'm, God, it's all helicopter talk, dude. It's okay, we're nerding like, out. Like we're it. nerding out Look, on choppers. Yeah, first fifteen minutes, guys, give us helicopters. Then we'll get into um, freaking Blackhawk. Yeah, come on, Blackhawk. I mean, the thing about a Blackhawk is it's a Blackhawk. First of all, right? Yeah, it's one of those things where you sit. So this is something that I kind of like. My whole life is based around this mantra of. If somebody thinks it's crazy and like completely undoable or doesn't make sense to do it or why, who, you know, you're not in the military. You thought I was in the military. I yeah. wasn't. I just do things that happen to do some of the stuff that those guys do. That's what I love to do. I want to do really, really hard things. I actually have a list of licenses that I want to get. Like I want to be a captain's license of like big vessels on the ocean. I want to have all these different licenses. And I have a bunch right now. My commercial, you know, CDL license, helicopter, they're playing those different things. So I'm stacking up those licenses. But uh Blackhawk is like the culmination of all these different things because A, there, there's so the government sells Blackhawks and companies come in and buy them, private companies. They fight fires with them, do different things with them. There's just not many people out there that are guys like me that are buying a Blackhawk and not going to put it to work because I'm not going to work it. It's not the, that's not the goal. Our goal is to do our search and rescue missions and some of the stuff that we do. And just fly my friends and family around in it, and, and have a Blackhawk. Because everyone needs a Blackhawk to fly your family and friends I like around. That slogan. Because there's nothing else <laughs> like on this planet that you can use to travel around with friends and family. You know, it's, it's the coolest way to do it. Yeah. How many people can get a Blackhawk? Fifteen. Seventy. Fifty. We will. Put Isn't it yacht certified? In there. You just get as many as you want, right? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's got fifteen seats. It's uh, it can pick up uh, nine thousand pounds from the hook. Um, so it's like a full truck and a half. It's got some serious capability, and it's fast, and it's safe. What's your favorite feature? My favorite feature of the Blackhawk? Fueling it up. Not yeah. that. Fueling Bur it up. Burning what it triple what I currently what, burn. What is gallons, it an hour? What is it an hour? 150 gallons an hour. Fun. 150 gallons an hour fun. are fun. Yep. Yeah. Mine's 23 an hour. Yeah. Yeah, so it's... <laughs> Mine's the Honda Civic at helicopters. It so. is. The best, best feature is by far your fortunate sun switch. I do have a switch that's... Um, it looks like an aircraft switch. And it says fortunate sun and it has an on or off toggle. And so you turn that on, you know, CCR. Yeah. It like plays the, 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 the ultimate helicopter yeah. song. It, it just plays that. that. It plays through yep. the headsets for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> on repeat? Yeah. Just over and over? Yeah. There's That's no hilarious. reason to play anything else. I don't think it, it's like I don't think you could get to play anything. You're else. always going to Vietnam as soon as you put that on. Yeah, always. Helicopters are cool, man. Blackhawk, really excited for it. Pick it up here in the next uh, two, weeks, two right? or three weeks. And I originally bought it because I wanted a Blackhawk. <laughs> but when I bought it, I also thought, okay, I want to be able to create content with this. I was a little nervous because anytime we create content that is 
way out there, way over the top, it becomes unrelatable. You know this. Yep. And uh, so I was like, I'm going to do it anyways, just because this is something I'm naturally doing. What I told our viewers when we kind of went back to, to YouTube full time was buckle up because we were just going to do a little bit of everything. Like we have such a diverse range of content. And the reason for that is because we're just going to show you things that I in particular am excited about. And I get excited about all sorts of different stuff and Black Hawk happens to be one of them. So we, we started creating the video series on it and uh, put it out there kind of like a click publish and, and hoped for not a bunch of hate and people saying, oh, you, you, you've lost touch with reality. You have Black Hawk. People have like gone insane over that content. Everybody That's awesome. Black Hawk. And, it's, and they're not feeling like I'm saying, ooh, look at my Blackhawk. I'm so no. cool. They're, they're like, this is amazing. Because no. I'm telling the whole story of how I got it, what we have to do to be able to legally fly it. Like, you don't just buy a Blackhawk and fly it. Like, it is a paperwork. You've done paperwork, FAA paperwork. This is it times a thousand. It is so brutal, dude. God. Um, but it's it's been fun to learn and it's been fun to show people and people are just eating it up. So it's down in uh, Lexington, Kentucky right now, as you know, uh, Thoroughbred Aviation. And it'll be done. It was supposed to be done this week. I was supposed to come yep. record with you and fly at home. Now it's going to be like another week or so. So I think next week, 10 days, we'll be have to make another stop grabbing it and then flying it. Yeah, it's if you're yeah, on the way. If you need your podcast studio moved, we'll yeah, just, we could we'll just hook up thing. to it Dude. and yeah. put her somewhere else. <laughs> That's everybody's biggest concern as far as like my mentors, my helicopter mentors is they know how I fly. I fly very low and aggressive and, you know, it's safe, but it's low and aggressive. Well, you can't really do that as much in a Blackhawk without like flipping destroying over everything, and, like blowing people's roofs off yeah. and stuff. So I got to be, uh, I got to learn just how violent it is and just be just this side of that line. You can't just land at your <laughs> buddy's house sometimes. No, I will. No, but he's it's going just, 100%. He's going buddies though. Yeah. Certain yeah, properties. Yeah, it's, it's, it, there's going to be a learning curve of, of how much of a shit storm I start every time I land somewhere. But uh, I mean, that's, a, that's not a bad problem to have, right? Sorry about your shingles. Yep. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> exactly. And your permanent fixtures. Bad but, I mean, Blackhawks are wild, man. They create a ridiculous amount of downwash. Um, yeah. I've seen tons of videos, like literally light poles coming yeah. down when yep. they fly by. And the, the heavier they are, the more weight you have in there, the more that rotor wash is kicking. So they, uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a process. I'm going to be very safe about the way I learned how to fly the Blackhawk. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Just so we're clear, I'm going to be very. He gonna, had to say that. I fly with some of the best pilots in the world, so I'm I'm aerobatic certified by Chuck Aaron, the old Red Bull pilot. So I was signed off. He said, "Yeah, you can fly upside down, do barrel rolls, loops, and the 105." So that's my goal. Like I said, become as proficient as possible. So I skip right past the flight schools and I go to the aerobatic pilots. I go to the guys that are doing the gnarly like mountain long lines and stuff like that because that's where you get the best experience. The best For training. sure. Yeah. God, I can't imagine. Yeah. Brittany, how do you feel about the hell? You're, you're learning how to fly, right? No. Are you not? No. She She's going to. Oh, it's not plugged in anymore. Oh, you, okay. We fully kicked her out of the show. This is we fully kicked her out of the show. I just want to. Okay, my voice right is now. here, but there's no camera. This is um, you try some sign language, or yeah, we can just. No, throw I. When I flew with him, like a not with him, but with the instructor, I was like, "There's no way I can learn this." That's but not the, true. You can the the, the instructor, I think, going to make me. Well, you know, when you fly with somebody, you pick up on things naturally. Yeah, like. That's probably what's gonna happen, and then she'll get comfortable. And mm -hmm. first of all, you got to be confident in helicopter. Yeah, like oh, yeah. if you're worried and stressed, that's a problem. You got to be comfortable with its what it does and how it works. Yeah, and then move into it. How's is Roman? Does he make you feel comfortable though? No, oh, he's never flown me yet. Oh, boy. yeah, hmm. not huh, even one time. Been, you're only solo. <laughs> yeah. Have you been signed off to solo? Not yet. I think it's coming real soon. Yeah, a few hours. You feel comfortable hovering? Obviously, yeah, the most yeah. Difficult, difficult part of flying. I feel like I can, I can fly no problem. Good. Yeah. What did you buy? Uh, R66. Okay. Yeah. It's a great helicopter yeah. to learn. I yeah. had to get the turbine. Everyone's like, just get the 44. I was like, nah. no. I would have told you absolutely not. No. Because you're never going to fly a piston helicopter. That's no. not what you want. It's no. not the route you're going. So why learn in something that you're going to immediately dump? The only thing that flying a piston helicopter would be good for would help you kind of learn power management to learn how to fly a helicopter with a very low power. Yeah. Makes you a little bit better pilot. But it's not like the rod, the 66 has a ton of power for a turbine. Anyways, yeah. you're going to be learning how to manage it and respect it. So. Yeah. And it has the extra seat. It has the cargo. Yeah. It was just perfect for my family. It's perfect. Yeah. All right. Next person says helicopter gets fined. Okay. We're moving on. Perfect. No more helicopters. What kind of fine? Are we talking about? <laughs> Let's jump into some, um, <sighs> how much have you guys talked about how this whole thing started for you guys? You guys ever get into like that deep? What were you doing before TV? What were you doing before... You know, we have. Uh, we wrote a book about it. Um, 
with Discovery Channel. Nobody um, reads, dude. Nobody yeah, reads. I want to hear it's it. True, we did an audio book with our sexy voices. <laughs> we recorded it. You guys mm-hmm. did the voice. Yeah, oh, that that's was actually awesome. kind of fun. That's all. What's the book called? Oh, uh, it was so. It, it wasn't a book that we actually. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. All right. It was Dis- more of a magazine. Magazine. Well, no. Discovery. Discovery wanted to write a book. They wanted us to write a book. So we Got used it. a ghostwriter. So it wasn't like we sat down and put together the thoughts. We met with a ghostwriter a handful of times, told him our story, and he put it into a book. He did Got a great it. job, but it wasn't. When you read it, it's like, and you know us. It's like there's a difference there. Got there's it. A disconnect. But anyways, um, so don't don't bother. It's called, with the it's book, called guys. Diesel Brothers, uh, and, and the truck worst and awesome part guide. is, yeah, they called the Truck and Awesome Guide to Trucks and Life, which is just awful. I hated that part of it. Mm-hmm. But I have this big. I have this big thing with being stuck in like a, a niche. I don't Truck like niche. I don't I don't like being cornered in, in any sort of world, which is what Diesel Brothers did. Mm. So I'm fast forwarding to kind of where where we were. But if you go back, um, long story short, uh, where do you even start? I mean, you start with a prank. No, nice. no, you start with uh, so Diesel Dave and I are kind of yin and yang. He is he is the most carefree, happy go lucky dude that you'll ever meet, and. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be walking through the airport and I'll I'll run into a stranger and they'll be like, hey, we met your friend uh, Diesel Dave here at the airport a few months ago. And just, will you tell him thanks for blessing our baby last week? <laughs> like, <laughs> wow, he, dude. No, that's not a joke. That's not an exaggeration. Like this man will meet a stranger and next thing you know, like he is, he is at family reunions. People love him, gravitate towards him. And he takes the time to sit and chat and converse with people. So he does that really well. So he's a natural, very, very lovable, likable guy. I, on the other hand, am always going and I don't like to get stopped. So if I have, a, I, I, if I have like a train of thought or if I have a task or an activity and somebody stops me, I can do the hello, how are you, thank you, take a picture, move on. I don't do small talk. Mm. I'm not good at small talk. He is literally small talk in human form. So it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's great small, dude, another story. It's good small talk. He's we're so small good talk. at it. We're, we're flying on a flight one time. There's a short flight, like it was like literally a 30 minute flight. Dave gets put in a seat behind me. I'm in front. I hear this like blah, 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 blah. And then I'm behind me like this conversation. I'm like, who is chatting away? Look back. This 55-year-old woman is crying on his shoulder, <laughs> sobbing, talking about her divorce. And Dave's just like, oh, yeah, it's going to be all right. Like just not really, <laughs> give, like he doesn't give great advice. He's just there. Oh, I'm a good listener. <laughs> he's a great listener. Like She wasn't a, even getting a divorce until that flight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's not <laughs> trying to solve the problem. He just wants to hear you out. And that usually solves the problems. He doesn't talk much. Like on the podcast, you're going to see like, <laughs> yeah, don't ask me a question. When we listen. first started doing podcasts, it was like, I'd give the pause and like the wait, like the missionary discussion, right? You'd have missionaries chatting back and forth. That's the world we come from. And I'd wait and, and he'd be like, oh. and there'd be like these awkward silence. <laughs> like the first episode we ever did with um, Andy Frazello, we were on his podcast. You should listen to it. It's, it's hilarious because it's me telling our story. And then I'm like, I'm talking too much. Give him a moment. And then just. Radio silence. And then I'd come back in and pick it up or Dave would like jump in and be like, I'm sorry, what were we talking about? <laughs> like, it'd just be like out there, but he is the... You can't say that. I'm a good listener. <laughs> he's a great he's a great <laughs> listener, but at the same time, he's in his own little world sometimes when it comes to, uh, you know, conversations like this. But the reason why I bring that up is because he's always there, always available, and people just gravitate towards him. I'm different. So he, what? We met at church. Okay, uh, the, so in the, the the Mormon religion, we don't call it Mormon anymore. It's Church of Jesus Christ. There's the singles wards, right? A singles ward is dedicated to 18 to 30 forever. As old as it takes. Yeah, 18 as old as it takes. to 35 <laughs> year old single young mm-hmm. adults, and they all go to this church together. And you know, the, the goal is to meet your wife. I met my wife there, but before I met my wife, the year <laughs> before, me. I met this guy, <laughs> and uh, we hit it off, became uh, buddies because we were both there looking for chicks. Um, found each other and, and uh, became bros. And so from that moment on, we, you know, always had this connection, um, just good buddies. He went the summer sales route for a while and went out and tried to sell. How'd that go, David? What'd you sell? Oh, super good. I made a lot of friends. <laughs> uh, did you make any money? No, I did security systems. But uh, I thought I sold like two, maybe three. <laughs> he would spend <laughs> the rough. entire day, he'd knock on someone's door. Obviously, they wouldn't want the security system. He was totally cool with that. And then he would just spend the rest of the day hanging out with them. Yeah. So not necessarily <laughs> great. Not really long How does that dishes? even happen? You, once you know Dave, that's you, a, just, you just know. That's a special being. It's, a, it's hot outside. Knocking doors wasn't fun. So if someone invites you into the AC, you take that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. And then you're swimming. And then yeah, you're, swimming. And then you're. He can't say no. He's not good at saying no. He's good at listening. And so did just, you serve a mission? I did. Served in Portugal. 
Portugal. Mm-hmm. Dang, you were probably a dope missionary. I feel like I was a pretty fun missionary. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> fun is the word he used. Do you yeah. notice that? Fun. Not fun. He's always been a fun guy. Well, well, He's fun in everything that he does. Not like, yeah. Yeah, so that's one cool thing is um, we both speak Portuguese. I served in Brazil and Bolivia. Um, so we, uh, we had that connection, obviously. We went back to my mission right before I got married, down to Bolivia and Brazil, and like ran amok through the rainforest and the jungle. Um, got a rental car stuck in the forest. Yeah, and that was like that was a year or two after we met. So obviously, again, going back to the story, um, we're bros hanging out. I see him kind of out just kind of running marathons on the Great Wall of China. That's one thing that he just just disappeared and did. He, <laughs> and he's doing just cool stuff, but there's no real like direction and the, the sales thing wasn't working out and he was like i would just work to make enough money to travel right see the world that's what was my goal all growing up just a hippie they do marathons on the great wall of china yeah and i was like if i run a marathon i'm going to do the funnest one because it's going to be one and done probably that's awesome <laughs> how far do you go the full 26.2 miles or whatever it is holy you go, i think you run about four or five miles of it actually on the wall and the rest is through surrounding cities of china is really cool actually yeah that's an epic area. if you're going to run one do it was that your last one? Yeah, well, you run up the wall, and then there's a lot of picture opportunities, so you don't really run the whole thing. You run up top, and then the whole group gets together. You do some selfies on the Did wall. Did you ride the, the sled slide down? No. The, what? the track? I don't think I even How, know about that. What's that even called? Alpine slide deal? Yeah. Like a, yeah, they have that at the Great Wall. Really? Oh, yeah. Looks like I'm going back. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have to be careful with how far we let him go. <laughs> <laughs> he took his passport and that's, that's the thing. He was, he was just living the life everywhere he went. Like, he had like nine different nicknames depending on what social circle you were running in. He was Twink, Twink Master Flex. Twink? Yeah. yeah Twink Master um, Flex is a good he, one. You know, everybody, like, there's still people that we run into that are just like, oh, Twink. Like, it's so good to see. It's been like 10, 15 yeah. years since anybody called him Twink. Um, but so he was like weeks away from taking this job selling mobile homes down in Arkansas. Yeah. And uh, he was going to go be a mobile home salesman. Because I, I was so good at security sales. I was like, sounds like you try to sell Yeah, homes. you have a yeah. solid record. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm back at home just grinding, trying to figure out any sort of business that's going to work. I don't come from money. I come from uh, probably lower middle class. Like my mom made my clothes growing up. And so uh, my dad died when I was 21, right after I got home from my mission. And um, really all I was left with was, you know, a mom to kind of take care of uh, and, and no... I had two credits of college education and I dropped out. I just couldn't do it. Uh, it wasn't working for me. So went and worked construction for my uncle for a little while, kind of learned that. And then 2008 hit and everything kind of fell apart as far as uh, the construction world. So I was like, I got to figure out a way to make money. Luckily, I wasn't married yet. I met my first soulmate, <laughs> yeah. Diesel Dave, and then a year later I was going to meet my wife. So I started doing, you know, um, tractor work, just kind of like rock walls, excavating, very mm. small and doing whatever we could to stay afloat in 2008, which was, was you know, tricky for anything construction related. But we were doing it. Driveway tear outs. Yeah, tearing out driveways, literally anything. Uh, you know, one day. Sprinkler so, line tear outs. So <laughs> it, it, it got really moving. And I was like, hey, Dave, like, you know, you should settle down a little bit and come work with me and, and run the equipment. And you and I will have this little company. So we start growing the company, start building it. We're, you know, doing pretty well. The jobs start getting bigger and bigger, which progressively happens in the dirt world. Um, Excavation companies, they're funny. It's, it's, it's something that's been fascinating to me because I watch people grow them all the time and they, they end up growing too fast and they just kind of tumble over because mm. it's like the opportunity, there's so much opportunity out there. So I knew that we couldn't do that because fortunately we couldn't because we couldn't get any loans back in 2008. There was no <laughs> SBA loans, there was nothing. So um, got very creative with the financing that we could get. Um, basically bought some cars at the auction and borrowed way too much money on them and that was my working capital. Got super creative. So we start doing these jobs. Anyways, we take on a job. It's probably the biggest job, job yet. It's tearing out a whole foundation of a house. And we had to rent a machine for it. Rented the machine. Um, it was what, 500 bucks a day or something like that. And uh, we were going to turn a good profit on the job. It was like three or four grand for two or three days worth of work. Good money for us. So we're cranking it out. And uh, we don't have a demolition hammer on the tractor. We just have the boom of the tractor. And we're just kind of swinging and hitting it and swinging and hitting it. And it's working. And we get down to like the last 10 feet of wall. And, uh, you know, we're a little bit confident at this point maybe a little overconfident and uh i start swinging and i'm hitting like a really thick section of the wall swing boom 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 hit and then next thing you know i see the arm of the tractor kind of like boomed out like that like bent funny and i'm like oh shit like this is a hundred fifty thousand dollar excavator that we're renting i didn't get the insurance i just bent the boom <sighs> and uh so that was it that was basically the kind of the, the 
the nail in the coffin of the excavation business because the 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 rental company came in and took everything that I had. Oh my gosh. Well, we tried uh, to fix it. We, we, we yeah, fixed banged the it the other way. We did. And we it looked straight. And then we <laughs> oh sent it back God. to the rental place. And I was like, sweet, we got away with that one scot free. We, we, <laughs> it later. was even worse than that because we we bent it back the other way. Uh -huh. Still a huge bulge in the beam. And then we found this like shady dude with like a welding yard out by the airport, like hidden in the swamp. He's like, I fix it. Yeah, that's fine. So we take it to him and we're like, You sure you got this? He's like, Yeah, 500 bucks. I got this. I'm like, Okay, cool. So he just welds a giant steel plate on it and then paints it. <laughs> and it's like the most obvious. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like it's obvious, but it also kind of isn't. So we're like, Yeah, yeah we feel good about this. <laughs> it's fine. Maybe no, they won't notice. <laughs> and so we're pretty confident the fix is going to be good and we're going to get away scot free. No, nah, they called me the. Two or three days later, and they're like, "Hey, we got to talk about what happened." They might have been machine. laughing on the other side. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was rough. So that that basically stopped the excavation mm -hmm. business altogether, which meant that there was no work for him. Which and means I, I went that to was travel again. Right around the same time, I was meeting my wife, so I was figuring out how to get married. Um, so he takes off, starts traveling. I get married. I've got like five hundred bucks to my name, which it's funny looking back then, five hundred to a thousand dollars was like was a lot of money. Like you're doing all right. Like I remember having a thousand bucks. Yeah, that was, remember that? So yeah. Good. I was, was like, like, I'm okay. I'm ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing okay. Like, yeah. I got a thousand bucks. It used to be like three to five hundred bucks at a time is where absolutely like, living was. Yeah. So I get married, and then I um, still 2010. I meet my wife in 09 at the same church I met him at. Um, we get married, and I got to figure out what I want to do for a living. So I I kind of start a little truck dealership with no money. Again, like I. I don't. I can't emphasize how difficult it was to get money back then. If you don't have family money. No banks are giving out money because they're just coming off the back of the recession. So I'm just getting super creative with these weird loans that the FBI later called me later years in my life about these loans. No um, way. Yeah, yeah. That's, I hired a company to basically do it for me. What they were doing, I guess, was totally illegal. I didn't know. I was just using their service. You're just taking the money. Yeah, I was just getting the money. and and But then I ended up with like nine car loans of what vehicles. We still get calls and like, hey, do you have this? Oh, four, four, F two fifty. It was. <laughs> it's valued at like a hundred grand. We're like, never was it ever worth a hundred grand. <laughs> yeah, the business model was. They were they, laundering. They, <laughs> they, they, they would no. You'd, you'd go buy a car at the auction. BMW was a good example. I bought a BMW that was booked for twenty five grand. I only paid like fourteen grand for it. I borrowed the twenty five. I was able to you know take ten grand in working capital and, and go to work with it. But then I had to figure out what to do with the car. So I was like, the, the guys that. You know, showed me this business model. They're like, "Oh, you'll lease the cars out. We have a leasing company." They made it seem like it was not shady, like it was. Right. It's just the business. Yeah. So, uh, so I lease all these cars out. This literally six cars on my credit that I'm leasing out to people. One person pays me. Like I'm repoing cars. <laughs> I'm chasing people down. I'm having like it. It was, dude. It was rough. I'm a repo guy. I don't have any money to repo the cars. I don't even have money to drive to go repo my own car. I'm just like, this is this sucks. What a mess. But I had the little bit of working capital, but I so I started buying and selling trucks. Um, and then buying and selling trucks started turning into buying and selling some of the heavy equipment that we were familiar with. And then um, that started working. So 2010, 2012, we kind of ran that business and then it got, you know, cranking so good that I called Dave back after his Well, I was out. I was out probably in China again. You sent me a text message with just a picture of a tow truck. The coolest tow truck that he went and bought at the auction. He's like, I need you to come run this. So I'm like, all right, I'm out of money. So I fly back I'm home and I'm driving his tow truck. We're repoing stuff. And I'm like, this is the coolest job ever. <laughs> he went from doing construction to now we're just rescuing vehicles in the middle of the night. So you hired the nicest guy you knew to do you be your repo guy? Yeah, yeah, he didn't last as the repo guy very long. Okay, I was going to say. <laughs> we, we repoed one Sir, thing I'm... and then I gave it back to the family that needed it. <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, yeah. I can't take your car. No, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't do well with that. But it was, uh, it, that was where I kind of started to pick up a little bit of momentum. And then, so at the same time, I'm going to go back a little bit because this will help you understand where my branding brain came from. In 2009, um, well, ever since high school, I worked with this guy named Rich Eggett. Rich owns a company called Rockwell Watches. Mm -hmm. Rockwell Watches is, um, it's a watch company, but really it's, it's like a, it's a super cross team. It's a, it's a, they have all these different action sports athletes that they sponsor. And so it's like a Red Bull, but in the watch world. They hired me, or I went to work with him from like 2008 to 2010, kind of selling marketing deals, just totally informally, just like as, as a bro deal. And I went in and I killed it. I sold like half a million dollars worth of marketing deals, which was the biggest deal they had ever sold. And I had no experience, no background. I just 
knew a couple of guys. Well, you're best friends with a salesman of the year. Yeah. Right? I thought about everything else. Yeah. 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 Of, of the, the year tricks. is his new name. That's what we're sticking of with. Of the year? Yeah. And then we'll know. Yeah, yeah. He literally cannot sell anything. <laughs> like it, it is, he'll give you whatever you want, but it is not for sale. Um, it but, was for sale. It was, it was for sale. And now it's, you know it, now, just have it. now it's just donated have it, to the cause. So anyways, I learned, I learned some marketing and branding stuff there. 2012, and this is, this is where kind of the social media story starts and all of our, you know, um, media business in general. We're doing well selling trucks, buying and selling more and more, and finally getting to the point where we're like making a little bit of money. I buy a truck in California. He flies out to pick it up, and it's like a modified diesel truck, kind of a, a cool, you know, truck at that time. And he's driving home. You bought a boat at the same time. Yeah, the boat. You're pulling the boat home. And at the time, he is sleeping on the in a hammock in the shop. Like that's full blown his that's house. Where he stays. He, 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 Sometimes I sleep out on the flatbed trailer if it's a nice night. Check out the stars. Yeah, we got some awesome pictures of him just passed. There's out a garden trailer. hose in the shop next to us. I shower with that. It was good. It was a nice homeless life I had going on. It nice was homeless. It life. wasn't like a hey once in a while he crashes on the like that was where he lived. Um, and so finally I was like okay well there's a couple things going on here. My friend and he was growing. He's right when he started growing a beard. And I was like clean cut. I just got married. I'm like dude you got to shave the he's beard. He's falling apart. Yeah yeah you got to get married. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being like the older brother like stop it. Like you got to you got to like get your shit together and meet you know get cleaned up and meet a nice girl. And uh, he's not listening. And so um, he starts making these videos and he's got bed head. He looks like he looks like, a, he looks like oh, a very right messier now, version of this. And he posted, he sent me this video driving this truck home from California. And he's like, says something goofy. I don't know what it was. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a funny video. I should put that on Facebook, you know, because everybody's using Facebook in 2012. I put it on there. And uh, it's mostly just for like friends and family. Yeah. I wake up and there's like 100,000 views on it. I'm like, what's happening? Why do people, why? I don't have friends with 100,000 people. <laughs> like, this doesn't make any sense. What is, what is going on? And, um, I quickly realized like, oh man, I got stuff that's going viral. So David make another video. I'd put it out there. It'd go viral. So I was like, okay, we need to create a page. Um, and not just my personal page. So we created a page called Diesel Trucks for Sale. And it was basically the page for our, our dealership to buy and sell trucks. And we had this goofy mascot who would make funny videos every once in a while. Because I'm a great salesman. So I'm on the trucks for sale page. Yeah. <laughs> and the, um, <laughs> you remember late 2012, I don't know if you remember this or not, but the floodgates of Facebook just opened and they didn't, it was before the algorithm came in and started nitpicking things. It was basically, they it just wanted anything to go yep. viral. So anything you put out there, if it was good content, it's how I think social media should be. It's, it's people who wanted to see it, saw it, and they engaged with it and they yeah. shared it. And, and so we had these pages that blew up really quick. Um, millions of followers from October, 2012 to the end of that year. So over the span of like wow. two months, we grew a couple of Facebook pages to millions. I'm talking mm -hmm. like um, big, big pages. And uh, we were still just this small truck dealership. So we didn't have enough product to sell these guys. We only had like four or five trucks at a time. Um, so we took a, uh, we took a little sabbatical um, during all this, you know, the hype and everything's going on just to kind of like clear our heads. And we, we bought an old school bus and we drove it from Salt Lake city to Costa Rica. Um, and that's a, it's like a 6,500 mile journey. And we loaded Holy 10 dudes in yeah. it and took out all the seats and hung hammocks and seats. And we we're just like, and, and couches and we we're just like, all right, let's go. So we drove, um, biggest mistake I ever made was not registering that school bus. <laughs> I put, I was a dealership. He's so still, right. Just I, so I, we're I, clear, he still doesn't register anything. Yeah, nothing <laughs> didn't learn <laughs> nothing <laughs> he owns is registered. No, the Jeep is. It's his first one for a long yeah, time. The true. dealership did that for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I put a temp tag on it. Um, driving a school bus into Mexico with a temp tag is a huge red flag, apparently. We didn't know that until we got to the border and we got jammed up. We're ready to get to Costa Rica, right? We mm -hmm. want to just make it on this trip. So um, <laughs> I spent three days at the border fighting with the Mexican customs. Um, three days? Yeah, yeah, three days camped just out. Just sleeping in the sand? or yeah, what? Sleeping yeah. in the bus, dude. <laughs> Playing soccer in the no man's land. And this <laughs> was it you that put the, the gun in there? You tried to bring, yes. Yeah. So Dave brings a gun. <laughs> Dave brings a gun in the on the bus trip, which is fine, but you don't want to take a gun into Mexico. I had a friend who told me to bring it. So, <laughs> so we get to the border, and um, and it's finally we're getting ready to cross after doing all this paperwork. Somebody takes the pistol and stashes it up in the ceiling of the bus, and uh, we're like going through the the, the X-ray. You know, the, the, well, we're, we weren't going through the X-ray. We were just going through customs, and they're like, "Oh no, you're a big vehicle. You got to go through the X-ray." So we're like, oh shit, Look, we can't go through the x-ray because there'll be a gun in here. We'll all go to jail. If you take a gun into Mexico, you're in jail for life. There's, there's really, there's, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's Americans, there's a Marine there who's still in prison because there was like shotgun shells in his, in his gear bag. What? It is rough. Gun laws in Mexico are no joke. 
So we knew that this was going to be like a bad time. So they put a guard to come on our bus and search it. And somebody just stashed the pistol up in the panel of the bus and tried to put all the screws in. It's like on the movies. They couldn't get the last screw in before the guard comes in and he's doing the slow, like, walk around the bus. And then there's, like, <laughs> there's this dangling One little screw. Piece of- yeah. So I remember it was you or somebody. Somebody took and hung, like, a like a camera bag from it so it looked like a hook so it wouldn't draw attention to it. So it would just look like it was natural. Had he seen that screw, which is where they're used to looking for drugs and stuff, he would have peel- peeled that back, pulled the gun out. We would have all gone to jail. So he, got, he, he, he jumps off. He's like, all right, go to the x-ray machine. We're like, okay, we're going to the x-ray machine. As soon as he gets off the bus, I just flip a fat bitch right back into America. <laughs> just the biggest, the fastest U-turn you've ever seen a bus do. And we go to a Burger King and I pull the gun out of the ceiling and I break it into a million pieces and I throw it in like a bunch of different dumpsters. Um, I don't even know why I told that story other than the fact that <laughs> it was, it was, you incriminate it was part of our, our 10 day trip to Costa Rica, um, which gave us time to kind of think about what we were going to do with this whole media business. And we decided that we wanted to double down on um, creating content. We didn't really know what creating content was at the time. Um, we knew that people had YouTube channels. Do you remember Devin Supertramp? Yeah, of course. So he yeah. was like from Utah. He was like the OG. Um, and he kind of ran in the, uh, in the same social circle as we did. And he was doing these big blob videos and different things. And, and um, we're like, oh, that's pretty entertaining. Like we could do, we could do some YouTube stuff. So 2013, we did, a, a, we started doing pranks, not on the, well, some of them were over the top level of what you did, like totally inappropriate. And some of them were like, we weren't even close to the stuff that you did. You've done some really awesome stuff. But one of our big pranks was basically, we had a friend that was um, going to the bathroom in, uh, in an office and we knew, he was in there and it was like a home office, like a detached office, kind of a weird setup. It was the, that, that Rockwell company. So we took this truck that we had that blew a lot of smoke back then. It was like- <laughs> It was that this, same one that we told the boat That we made with. the first video yeah. with, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Back in the day, we were a little more reckless when it came to like- Of course. You know, diesels blowing smoke and stuff. Uh, we've since matured quite a bit and I have to legally say that and I'm I actually so have to now. personally say that. Um, but this truck blew just an astronomical amount of smoke. <laughs> We hooked a landscape pipe up to the tailpipe, ran it through the window, and Dave held it there while I hit the gas, and we filled the bathroom with smoke. And it was a white it's, bathroom, it's, it's, and it was completely black by the time we were done. Yeah, and you see our buddy come come out. He looks like a coal miner, and he's just screaming and yelling, and and uh, <laughs> pants around his ankles. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was and it was April Fools. So it was a great April Fools prank. Great video. We posted it, and we get like a million views overnight on YouTube, and we're like, okay, we got Facebook that's doing this crazy thing. We got YouTube is doing this crazy thing. This is wild. What are we going to do with this? And we still don't have a product to sell other than our tr- used truck dealership. So right after that video went viral, Jay Leno's people called us and they're like, hey, we love your video. We want to have you on a segment called Prank You Very Much. Um, we're like, all right, this is cool. So go down there on the Leno show, show the segment. The day after that aired, our phone just never stopped ringing. Discovery, all these talent companies, production companies, people calling us like crazy. Like, oh, we want to do something with you guys. And we were like, no, no, you guys are like, you're lying to us. Like we thought it was the talent scout at the mall trying to make you famous, but it was like just a scam. So we blew them off. For, I was like, you're not getting me again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <we've done laughs> too many times. Uh, your headshots are pretty good. Though. They look good. He right? got you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, we didn't think it was real and we blew them off. And then uh, about five, six months after blowing them off, we finally get an email from like one of the heads at Discovery and they're like, like, hey guys, Quit being stupid. Like this is an actual offer. We're gonna, we're gonna guarantee you. I think it was six episodes, uh, and so they they made it more formal to the point where we're like, oh, okay. Like they might this might be a real offer. They sent out a guy with a video camera, Burt Clacy. He was like the original uh, producer of our show, and uh, he was out here for two or three days. Went back, sliced up this edit, and it was like greenlit all the way through. As mm-hmm. soon as they saw it, they were just like done because this was right after Duck Dynasty was kind of like dying. There was a hole in the market for some weird looking bearded dudes yeah. doing crazy stuff. Um, Fast and Loud was getting ready to start dying on Discovery Channel. So there was a there was a perfect hole in the market for us. So we uh, we took the deal and for, this is one of my biggest, I don't have regrets, but something that I would have done differently is as soon as we started filming for Discovery Channel, because they came in and just went full speed ahead. Like our, our shop went from a little shop to a full blown TV studio. Mm. We could no longer do like the builds and the selling stuff that we wanted to. We had to focus on doing these crazy over the top TV show builds, right? which is really hard to do on camera. Um, most reality TV shows, if you're familiar with it, they can shoot an episode in about a week. Um, 
so the plan was to shoot eight, uh, six or eight episodes for the first season, and it was going to take six or eight weeks, whatever it was. Week eight comes around, and we haven't finished an episode yet because we haven't finished a build yet because our builds are ridiculously over the top, and they take time. And somebody miscalculated their, like, the timing. So fast forward a year later, we're barely finishing season one, which was eight episodes, um, and uh, it airs. And it's the number one series premiere in all of Discovery Automotive history or something. It was a hit. It took off like crazy and uh, got them the ratings that they were excited about. So we got very focused on making more episodes of that. And in doing that, we stayed on social media for, you know, Instagram and Facebook, but we stopped doing YouTube yeah. just because we couldn't. Like, yeah. And at the same time, we only created like five or six videos on YouTube even before we went viral with some of the other stuff. So we didn't really know what YouTube was. Like it was back when you thought you could do, or we thought we could do like a two minute skit and put it on YouTube and that they, that would be valuable. We didn't understand watch time. We didn't yeah. understand vlogging. We didn't understand any of that world. Didn't even know what it was. Um, so we just kind of let YouTube simmer, just all the fan base and everybody that we created there. We said, hey, come over, you know, watch the TV show. So TV show ran uh, solid. Um, well, here's Still the thing. Running. Here's the thing, Roman. <laughs> This is why this podcast is going to be uh, interesting. We're going to give you, we're going to tell you things that we we haven't been able to tell anybody else yet. And a few different things across the board. It's information that people have been waiting on. Let's go. So you're going to get like the scoop. Been waiting the, for this. You're going to get the exclusive. Um, so TV show aired in 2016. And uh, we filmed roughly a full season every year, which is stupid. Like you should not, we should be filming three seasons a year. But what we do takes time. And so that was good. That was also bad for us because Discovery would have loved to run 40 episodes a year, but we can only create eight to 10. So COVID hit. Um, everything got shut down as far as filming goes. And then they came back to film after COVID. And at that point, I was just like, I'm not really enjoying this anymore. Like, mm. A, like I told you earlier on, I don't like getting cornered into a niche. How did you feel like when you were just a prank guy? Well, I did a uh, YouTube Red show, mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was like devastating to my YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, because I was pulled a different. When I was daily vlogging, that's the only thing I had time for. Right. Anything else would take away from what I was really popping in. So I've done a couple shows, and it took away from what I enjoyed doing. Right. So I can relate a little bit there. Yeah. So it, it just got to the point where we, I got tired of being called just the truck guy. And the problem also was, even though there was four main characters on the show, um, and these guys did awesome, and they, you know, um, it was myself, um, Diesel Dave, Redbeard, and The Muscle. And we're all really close friends, and we were going into the show. And we all just kind of had this agreement that if it ever sucks, we're done. We're going to get out, which most reality TV shows don't. Like, when you're in... It's all you've got. You've signed you up. You hang on. Yeah. Well, that you either, you're either stuck contractually or you don't see anywhere else to go and you, you're you scared, right? You don't want to lose that. Um, I didn't feel that way. I just felt like, I felt like the day that I'm done is the day that I'm done and I just, I'm not going to do it anymore. So we shot our last season or our most recent season like a year, almost a year and a half ago. Yeah. Which is, th this is very frustrating for me and Discovery is probably going to hate that I'm talking about this. This isn't talking bad about them. This no. is frustration with their process. The builds that we did that are going to air on the new season, which comes out November 4th, I think, this year. Which this November is new 9th. news. Like, nobody knows this yet. This yeah, is yeah. A new season of Diesel Brothers coming out. Everybody thinks the show was either done or canceled or whatever. Mm. Um, it's not. It's We still have a season in the can that was filmed like a year and a half ago. And um, complications from COVID and different things like that, the reason why it's delayed. But at the end of the day, there's no reason it should have been pushed back this far. Like, this other than the editing took a while, but I feel like it should have aired at least this summer, if not sooner. Um, but in going into this, this last season, I told all the producers, I said, I'm done. This is it. I don't want to do any more. Um, and I don't think anybody believed me. I think they all thought like, everybody says that. Yeah. And I'm not easy to work with when I want something like when I want my way, it's my way. Like it's going to happen. Um, and I, I very much felt that way, but they just thought that maybe dangling more of this or that. At the end of the day, I said, I'm done. We're, we're, no, we're no more. So this season coming up is the last season of Diesel Brothers. And they finally understand that on the discovery and the production side. And so that's how they're marketing it, is the final season of Diesel Brothers, which to me is a huge weight lifted off my shoulders because um, I would continue to do network television if they would let us do real stuff. Yeah, that's the tough balance. 
but you hear it all the time. Everyone's like, oh, reality TV's fake. It's this, it's that. It's like, you're right. It is scripted in a lot of ways and there is dr fabricated drama, but it's worse than that. It's the fact that they only highlight and, and focus in on one little aspect of your life and you start to feel like a puppet. You start mm. to feel like somebody who you're not. And I was realizing like, man, I have all these other interests. I have all these other things that I do when the camera's not rolling. And the things that I do off camera happen to be the things that people love on the show the most. Like when, when Discovery would kind of dip into this world a little bit and kind of show like what we were doing outside of the shop, people would go nuts and they'd love it. And uh, so finally, this, uh, this was 2020, October. Um, we hadn't posted anything on YouTube for five years. My, uh, the Heavy D Sparks channel where we post everything now had maybe 40,000 subscribers. That It was just stagnant, dead. And you know, it's, it's hard to bring a channel back after it's been dead for that long. Yes. Um, so we were just like, all right, let's, let's uh, two, two things. A, we're going to show Discovery what an actual spinoff could look like of us not doing truck builds. Um, we're just going to follow our recoveries or whatever's happening in our life. And B, um, we just want to, we want to be back on YouTube because we feel like I saw the, I saw the change coming in, in the way Instagram was falling off and, and all these other platforms were trying to clamor for attention, but nothing was really working that well outside of YouTube. So that was the, my goal was to say, Hey, let's show discovery that we can create like our own TV show that would, that would perform well. And then also let's go make some money on YouTube. And uh, we started posting on October, to, uh, 2020 and it blew up. Um, luckily, even our first video was just like a huge hit and we didn't know anything still 2020. I don't know the algorithm. I don't know. You should see my thumbnails from back in 2020. Mm -hmm. They were, I was just letting YouTube grab random screen grabs. Like I didn't know. Damn. Yeah, I didn't dude. know. Bro, the first, I remember the first video I was filming with my iPhone. We were in a hotel. We were making a TikTok or something. Yeah. And I said, I was like, I was just filming and Diesel's like, what are you doing? I'm like, we're vlogging, man. We're shooting a YouTube video. He's like, what is that? What is that? 2020. Like, this is two makes years no ago. Sense. Yeah, that's he, recent. He, he doesn't know what vlogging is. <laughs> I barely know what vlogging is. See, the thing is, I've always, I always knew that YouTube was going to be hard. And so I knew that if I did it, I had to go all the way in or else I didn't want to go in at all. So I didn't want to try to get to know it and just kind of dabble in it because I would have got frustrated. Yeah. So that's why we waited and held off. And then once we went in... I was just like, all right, we are going to figure this out. That's why I've always had so much respect for you guys because you guys figured it out earlier. And dude, YouTube is unlike anything on this planet. The viewers, the experience, the way you have to engage with them, there is nothing else like it. And for better and worse, because yeah. once you have those people, bro, you've got fans for life. People are going to follow you to the grave because of what you'd created on YouTube. Um, but you also... It's a commitment. It's a relationship, yeah. right? It's a life. It's a life. It is. And I didn't yeah. get that. I thought it was like, oh, this is some spare content. Let's just throw dabble. it on there. Like, you can't dabble on YouTube. You can't dabble and they're always uh, changing. Yeah. Right? So when we were in our prime, it was the Wild West. You post, like what you were saying about Facebook, you just post whatever you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just want viral content. Yeah. That's kind of where we were right place, right time with the pranks and the vlogs. And when the, did you start? 2009. 2009. Yeah. And what was the heyday? 2014. 14, 15, 16. Was that the prank stuff or had you rolled into the vlogging? By the then? vlogging would yeah. heavily surpass the pranks. Because yeah. the vlog channel is what, 15 million subs, something like that? Yeah. Jeez. Is there a prank channel? Yeah. Separate. Yeah. And now there's the podcast channel. So main yeah. three channels. Yeah. And I've pretty much left each one. Yeah. Like I haven't left the vlog channel, but right. we just kind of dabble and right. BTS, things like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'd like to do more on there for on sure. On the vlog channel? Yeah. Now that... Do you feel like you would like to do more on there now that you don't have to? Maybe, but I think I also miss out on like the the, the camaraderie of things that happen outside this podcast. Right. And like going outside the shop and catching those moments. That's where I'm now missing. But are you going to do it on your terms this time rather than the daily terms? Because that's a rough life. Yeah, I can't do the daily. No. I don't know how I ever did that. I don't know how anybody does that. It's dangerous between i mean i've heard mm -hmm. i've heard a little bit on logan's podcast you're talking about shooting all day editing all night yeah that alone is really really taxing but then you have to come up with things to do and like Dude, you have to have a daily schedule that, that's not just you kicking around like you can't have a casual day yeah and we were at a size where the pressure to outdo yourself each day yeah. was a real thing right it was like i can't just hang out at the house today right. we gotta go big yeah and you're doing that year after year after year it just starts to like, I was just in it. I didn't even realize it. Right. Not until I stopped doing it, but I was like, holy crap, I just aged like 10 years. 
in the matter of four oh, or five years. Dude, it beat me to death. Yeah. Yeah. Was it hard on your relationship? No, I don't think so. Was it? She can't talk. <laughs> She's asleep on the couch. You're supposed to be correcting and fact checking. <laughs> no, I think we were so in. We started this together. Yeah. Like we literally started YouTube together. So I think we were just all in together. Yeah. I don't ever remember fighting over YouTube. Were you yeah. both on the same page when it came time to slow down? Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. Just been like a, a, a unit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, what's cool though, and the reason why I got into what you did is, is you pay your dues big time. You went in and you showed YouTube viewers that you have what it takes to commit to the daily this, daily that. And we knew that we could not get into YouTube if we weren't going to make that full commitment. He'd been trying to get me to go back oh, on YouTube since so like 2018. And we did a video and we, we either wouldn't edit it or we wouldn't post it or whatever wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. When I knew that it was time and that we were back in, when I make my mind up, yeah. it's a dangerous thing because it's like, go. All in. All, all in. Yeah. And and it's not just going to be all in. It's going to be the best damn content you've ever seen. And we're going to try to figure out how to carve out a niche of content in a world where there's a bunch of guys that already do what we do, but we're going to do it differently and we're going to get people. And my whole, I came in with a chip on my shoulder from being the truck guy. And so I said, I am not just going to be the truck guy anymore. I'm going to be the grandma guy. I'm going to be the little kids watching. I'm going to be, I want to be a household um, you know, entertainment with what we do. I want to provide that because that's what our TV show kind of became. Yeah. Originally, they were targeting the 18 to 45-year-old male demographic with our show. It became a family show in no time at all because, you know, we goof around. We do fun stuff. Yeah. And, and it wasn't just like the spark plug goes here, you do this. It wasn't just a build process show. So um, I don't know where spark plugs go anyway. Yeah, we don't we do a lot <laughs> no of spark clue. plug stuff. Um, so that's where we're at now. Um, with the YouTube channel, we... We're really, I mean, we are, we are in it. We are committed and we're not just committed because we have to be, but we're committed because we want to become the best. I mean, we grew two, two and a half million subs in two years. So epic. Yeah. It was good growth. Enough. Yeah. And Huge. our, our, if you look at our watch times and our CPM, we have really, really great viewers. Um, it's awesome. not just, it's not just views. Yeah. Like we are getting solid, solid. I mean, we're growing by like a hundred and. 50 to 250,000 subs every single month. Wow. And it's because we're not just being the truck guys. I think people, Cletus told me, he's like, he's like, dude, when I watch your, your channel, like, I feel like I just got part, handed like a party sack with all these different things in it. And I reach yeah. and I don't know what I'm going to get. And I love that. I want to be that. I want to know, like, you know, it, tomorrow I might post a video. Tomorrow we probably are going to post, post a video about uh, diving, searching for a missing person. Um, and then in a few days after that, you're going to see us taking, you know, Chris Harry is fitness um, YouTuber. He's like an Asian kid. Sounds so familiar. He's, yeah, he's got a big channel. I can't remember the name of his big channel. If you've ever done an abs video online, you probably did his. <laughs> yeah. It's what I was texting you the other day, though. We took him and another guy and dropped him off on an island in the middle That's of right. Salt Lake. So it's almost like a Mr. Beast style yeah. challenge, but it's more real. Yeah. Less games and more like, hey, like if you guys don't get off, it's going to suck for you. And yeah. we left them in, in the middle of nowhere. So survival challenges, um, but... The, the whole purpose behind what we're doing is it needs to be meaningful and relatable. So if, if you don't, if you watch one of our videos and it's over and you don't feel like sad, mad, happy, horny, whatever it is, if you don't <laughs> whoa, feel one whoa, of these whoa. emotions. All, 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 all the above. All yeah. the above. What video was I supposed to get the horny we vibe wanna, from? <laughs> that one's coming. Is it? We want to compel you. We want to, we want to watch, have the viewers have an experience and go on that ride. That's cool. And then we also want to take, we've always kind of been focused on helping other people. That's Utah in, in a nutshell yep. is serving each other. So we want to take that to another level. And that's why we started working on these cold cases of searching for missing people. Um, and uh, Dude, we, that stuff's wild. It is wild, man. Wild. Because you get a whole new demographic to too. To it's yeah. crazy. The, the, oh, bro. The true, wild. the true crime demographic is probably the biggest demographic out there. Uh, it's on podcasts too, right? Exactly. Like yeah. These uh, these true crime podcasts are yep. crazy big. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, it's funny. Uh, when we started posting some of the missing person searches, like my wife would start getting messages from girls her age. Like, hey, I love your husband. I love what he's doing. She's like, what video did he post? And it's like, oh, it's a missing person one. Like all these true crime moms that yeah. you know, moms love it. But um, it's also very meaningful for us because we're able to... We have access to resources and equipment that law enforcement either doesn't have access to or can't get approval to use, mm. and we can just go in and do it tomorrow. So, like, for example, last two or three days ago, we were flying a specialty drone out in a military operating area in the West Desert of Utah searching for a clandestine grave of a kid who went missing in May. 
And they've been trying to get the FBI to do it for three months and they couldn't get approval. Nobody could get approval for law enforcement to do it. We heard about it. We were there the next day. And so that's what's cool is we're able to take our ad revenue and pour it back into buying more equipment to like, we're to the point where we're actually rescuing people and going out like Monday, um, we're flying up to Washington and uh, we got the call out of out of pretty much every company in the in the country to recover an airplane crash on the top of a, a big mountain up in Oregon. And um, we're actually recovering the guy's remains too. So there's the body's still there. Oh my god! So it's gone from like us pulling tractors out of the mud to now we're using specialty equipment and doing things and going places that search and rescue can't even do because we have the resources to do it. And that's that's where we're pouring all of the resources back into the channel to grow that way. Dude, what's the process of pulling a body out? It's rough, man. Um, that's it depends on, on on how and where the body. So we, we have um, we have some friends that run Adventures with Purpose YouTube channel. They're rescue divers, and their whole niche is solving cold cases by diving in bodies of water where the person was last seen. And tip and usually they'll find their person's car, and in a lot of cases they'll find the body in there. So that's a body underwater, right? You you, you work with law enforcement, you pull it out. A plane crash is a whole different story because um, bodies no longer just there, right? bodies everywhere. So that one is going to be, it's going to be rough, man. It's like, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible process. And even the coroner and sheriff can't get access to this. So they, you know, I had the phone call with them yesterday and it's like, Hey, you are going to be the one that's, that's doing that. So take a body bag and you take, you know, have all the equipment to be safe. Um, and, and protect yourself from. He didn't tell us that <laughs> part of the story till we got here to your yeah. place. Yeah. I didn't find out until yesterday, but Anytime we search for a missing person, we are always prepared to find a body. If you find a body in a missing person case, everything stops. The whole world stops, mm-hmm. and you have to wait for law enforcement to come in. And then now they show um, up. Then yeah, then they show <laughs> up, and then but even then, in most cases, they would require us to extract the body because they're not able to do it. So that's um that's a meaningful thing for us. And wow. I'll tell you the reason why on this plane, this plane crash one, dude pl- crashes a uh, plane two weeks ago. Older guy, you know, beautiful family, has a wife, has three kids. Um, he was retired. Terrible accident, crashed into a mountain. Well, all the finances were in his name. So when he died, his wife went down to the bank. was like, hey, my husband died. Like, he was in this plane crash. I need to get access to the bank account. And um, the bank's like, no, you can't. We need a death certificate. So she's like, hmm, okay. Well, I, he's dead, but okay. So she goes down to the corner, and they're like, hey, can I get a death certificate? They're like, no, you can't get a death certificate until you get the remains all of his remains back to us, which I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to me. So she's locked out of all of her bank accounts. Forest Service and NTSB want her. She's responsible for paying for the plane recovery because there's no insurance. It's $50,000. She doesn't have $50,000. So she's stuck in limbo for weeks at a time. The family started a little, what really got me was the family started to go fund me for 50 grand to raise the money for it. And when I looked at it a couple days ago, it was like 1500 bucks. So I was like, nah, we're doing this. Like, so I called and called and called. And it's always weird because I'm Joe Blow, or if they know me, I'm got the guy from YouTube or yeah. TV, and I'm offering to recover their, you know, deceased loved one from a plane accident. And I'm offering to do it for free. Like those first <laughs> first five minutes of every oh, phone man. call are very weird. They, they, like they don't believe me. They think yeah. they're getting scammed. Once they do believe me, then they don't they don't truly believe that it's happening. Like they become like a little kind of kind of come into shock a little bit. So it's rewarding, man. It's um, doing the Lord's work, man. Yeah, I would say it's it's something we're, we specialize. We pride ourselves on being able to go anywhere, rescue anyone or anything at any time, in any condition, any weather, and we are starting to get really good at it. And that's not what direction that we were going. Yeah. We just started by rescuing our own stuff, and then we started getting better at it. And other people started calling us. So um, I'm I'm just really fortunate that it's makes good YouTube content and that people watch it. Um, but that's why, going back to the diversity of the content, we can put anything on the channel now because we have proven to the viewers that we're going to be consistent. Whether it's a Black Hawk update yeah. or a search and rescue You're or just get, a fun little yeah. you know, island survival video, we will be consistent. We'll continue to give our all. Yeah. And, and you can tell in our production quality. Like We take a lot of pride in making sure that you're watching like a mini movie. That's cool. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. So that's, that's where we're at right now. We have, I have a few... <sighs> I don't want to, where are we at on time? Oh, you're fine, dude. I'll, um, there's a couple of other updates and things that I can talk about that other viewers are going to want to hear. And so yeah. I'll just dive right into yeah, it. Yeah, give it to them. 
in 2020, um, I was approached by a friend of mine who had a, uh, he owned a electric uh, vehicle company. Oh, geez, you're going here. Yeah, this is. I'm not going to make this the, is the full next conversation. That was a hard turn. I'm not going to make the full oh, announcement. Wow. But we went from we dead go. to people. Yeah, yeah. Hold it on is. tight, folks. Yeah, this is a Nikola, okay. Nikola update. So I'll be wearing your harness. a lot of people have been waiting to hear about this. A buddy of mine started a company called Nikola Motors. Um, Nikola was basically an electric semi truck company, and then he came to me in 2020. And said, "Hey, I want to release a pickup truck. Let's take it to the market." And then um, that same year, they were going public. Have you heard of Nikola? Just N Tesla. Nikola's been so. Yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> it was. It was rivaling Tesla, kind of mm. like neck and neck, um, but they were mostly semi trucks. Anyways, Trevor Milton, my buddy, who who um, who was actually currently in um, trial in New York for a bunch of stuff that happened regarding the story. Um, but anyways, he came to me and said, "Hey, I want to release a truck." I said, "That's a great idea." He said, "I want you to be the face behind it. I want you to help me design it." So I said, "All right, let's do it." So we worked out this deal for me to. You know, have a piece of that program, the truck program. It's called the Nikola Badger, and uh, we will, like literally just went to the races on trying to figure out how to build this truck and develop it. And um, and at the same time, the company was going public in June of twenty one or twenty. Mm. It was twenty. The company went public, I think, in June of twenty twenty. The day the company went public, it became worth more than Ford. It became worth more than like the share prices surged up to like almost a hundred bucks a share. It was. Insane, like just absolutely out of control. And we were getting pre-orders for this electric truck, this like the cyber truck, but way yep. cooler um, that we were going to build. And um, again, we were just selling pre-orders and reservations. We sold like, it was like half a billion dollars worth of trucks oh in, my God. in a matter of a few weeks with nothing but a, a rendering. We didn't have the truck yet because it was still being built. So one thing that we promised, uh, well, that the company talked about having you gotta be so careful Jeez. in this world of <laughs> promises and this and that i'm just this is i gotta hit you with the disclaimer this is not um this is not none of this information is is like designed to help anybody make any sort of decision based off of like stocks or anything like that and it's not also it's also not designed to be like a fact-based step-by-step of what happened it's just my view of kind of where things happened <laughs> You're making this whole thing up. I'm making this whole <laughs> thing up. I wish I was. This some is days. fantasy island. So the company goes public, blows up. Um, Trevor, my buddy, becomes uh, one of the newest billionaires on the Forbes list. I was there at his house that day. That Forbes called and he was like worth 14 billion with all of his his, share, his shares in the company. Um, and again, the company was worth more than Ford for a few weeks. And it's an electric heck? company that electric truck company that really hadn't delivered a lot of vehicles yet. It was close to delivering its semis. But people were really excited about it. They were excited about the electric truck, they were uh, the pickup truck. They were excited about the, the semi. They were just excited about everything that was going on. And uh, then uh, late, let's call it August or September, um, a company called Hindenburg Research, um, there's a short seller uh, based out of uh, New York. They watched the stock go up and they found they saw an opportunity and they, came, they wrote this huge report mixed with um, all sorts of information, half-truths, some truths, lies, flat out, like just basically compiled this whole story about Trevor and who he was and what type of person he was. And they released it. And right before they did that, they went short on the stock and they tanked the stock and they made like $800 million or something. It was oh so ridiculous. Don't gosh, quote me on the number, but it was dude. some huge number based off this report, which like I said, Trevor is a hard guy to get along with sometimes. Like he has made a lot of enemies along the way, but um, they accused him of like blatant scam and this and all this, these terrible things, which I, I, I disagree with pretty much the whole report, but that sparked an investigation. Well, when the investigation happened, the board at Nikola removed Nikola or removed Trevor from the company, basically completely kicked him off. But I still had to deal with the company because I was supposed to take ownership in this Badger program. And what people don't realize is the Badger program was still going. Everybody thinks that the Badger was just me, went out there with a picture and said, hey, look, this is going to be a cool truck, buy the stock. That wasn't it. It was me behind the scenes building an actual truck, working with the, not building it personally, but working with the manufacturers. And uh, there was two prototype trucks that were supposed to be ready for a show in December of, of 2020. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, and nobody knows this, <laughs> those trucks got built and they were delivered by the date that they were supposed to be delivered. But since Trevor had been removed and there was so much drama and accusations and all these different things, like GM was the partner to build this truck. It was a huge deal. Once GM heard about the report, they pulled out. It was just this big drama. Like if you look up Trevor Milton, you'll see the whole thing. So 
a lot of people, a lot of retail investors lost a lot of money because they jumped in at a hundred bucks a share. And then right. this, this short seller comes out, tanks the stock with a report that wasn't a hundred percent true by any means. And, uh, and so the Badger program basically just poof, disappeared. Well, that left me holding the bag of, I just told all these people that we're going to build this electric truck and now I can't even talk about it. Like the lawyers are like, you can't talk about it. You can't say anything. Just, just lay low, shut up and, and don't do anything. And a lot of people bought stock too. Mm -hmm. That was the crappy part. Yeah. A lot, a and, lot you, of our, and you never told people to. No. Like me, for example, I bought a bunch of shares. People bought the <laughs> at stock. At the highest point because I was like, it's just a starting company. This is where it's going to go way higher. higher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And then all these allegations come out and then it just tanks. So like I still amount a ton of money from it. Well, we just had this, we had this beautiful path to like success. We were having this new pickup truck that was going to enter the market. It was being built by GM. We had uh, UTVs, wave runners, um, semi trucks, this whole range of products. And everything was starting to come together. Semi trucks were being delivered like on the road. Um, so that gets canceled and I get basically shoved in the closet. They're like, don't say a word. And I was like, this up, ready to go like, you know, basically go after this company that just told me to shut up and, and to deliver on, because I never got paid a single penny on the deal. It was all based off of performance. If the Badger program became what it was, then I was going to get a chunk of equity. Um, this is, so that's the backstory behind <laughs> where, how we got to all this. Um, Trevor's been under investigation for the last two years. His trial finally happened uh, beginning of October or beginning, beginning of September. For, it's been going yeah. for about four weeks now. And um, this is where they are trying him for, it's a jury trial, a huge trial Jeez. in New York. It is a monster trial. That's big money. It's huge. Big I mean, money. dude, the, so Nikola, as part of the whole thing, they got fined $120 million just for their part in saying, basically the accusations were that Trevor and the company were making false statements about how far uh, advanced the technology was. Um, and there's all sorts of things you can see online about uh, what he said and what he didn't say. In my opinion, it was a CEO trying to rally the troops and get people excited about the company. But when you're a public company, you have, their company, you have to be very careful with what you do and don't say and forward looking statements and stuff like that. So that's kind of what the whole trial was based around, whether or not Trevor intentionally said things that were um, true or Jeez, false. Man. So um, he's a good friend. He's been a friend of mine for a long, long time. Friday of this week, he'll the jury's going to make a decision and it's going to be either it's kind of like an all or nothing deal. I think there's four or five counts. And if he's guilty on one, he almost has to be guilty on all of them. That's kind of how the way it looks right mm -hmm. now. And uh, we find out whether or not whether or not the judge and the jury think that he actually was intentionally trying to mislead people, which is a big deal for him, right? This is the difference between probably prison or not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's still worth billions of dollars because he still has his shares in the company. The, t the shares have tanked, but he made a bunch of money along the way. Um, but the reason why I tell the story is because meanwhile, in the background, while all this garbage has been happening and the company's been getting just absolutely hammered. Um, I've been working very closely with the Nikola team and with a bunch of different people to keep that program alive because there's two Badger pickup trucks that we promised that would be ready to show. They're prototypes and they're not production trucks, but they, they look like production trucks. Um, they're done sitting there, ready to go, ready to be announced. And that program's ready to be, you know, pushed out there. So, um, I can't tell you exactly what's happening, but I can tell you that the Badger program um, is not dead. It's it's uh, there could be something coming as soon as within the next few weeks. Um, talking about the future of what will become of that, hmm. uh, whether it's the prototypes or a full company, um, I can't I can't say that until if the you know we make the foreign press announcement or press release. But the reason I tell you this because there's a lot of people watching this that know me. Yeah. Um, that think that I just went quiet on it and just was like, oh, well, I made my money and I'm and I'm going to step away now. I didn't make any money. I haven't made a single penny and it's cost me a lot of money. It's cost me my reputation. A lot of time. A lot of, a lot of time mm -hmm. and a lot of just brain damage from people thinking that the, the scam report that was written about Trevor, which I, again, was already kind of very skewed because they were making a bunch of money off of making them look bad. I was kind of tied to that in some ways to people thinking that I made a bunch of money and then walked away. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. I've been working behind the scenes and there's, there could be a very large transaction that happens very soon where what I promised and what I talked about trying to bring to the market, um, might come to light very soon. Um, so it's, a uh, people are going to be losing their mind about that because I, the last update video I promised was like last 
July of 2021. Bro, he'll make posts and still get hate on it. Like it's crazy. Just well, not just hate, but people just want to know. People, like, yeah. Since I had to go radio silence on it, it's yeah. like, what the hell, dude? Like, I, I I supported this company I bought in because of you. Yep. Which I obviously I'm flattered by, but at the same time, it's dangerous because I don't, I don't, I'm not going to tell anybody how to, you know, invest stocks, yeah, especially tough, a company dude. that I have a, 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 you know, interest in. But I'm just really happy about this because it's going to be a huge moment of vindication for me because um, it's just proof that we haven't that we've been working really hard behind the scenes to build something really cool and it's it's something that i'm actually really proud of and really excited about and it's it's the same thing that people were really excited about when we first came out and talked about it so it's gonna be a big moment that's um, cool yeah yeah so there's there's that that's a that's a big bomb um and then isn't it crazy I, you just never know where you're gonna be ever I try to explain this to people it's like you cannot there's no five-year plan I don't you can want be a five-year so plan. many different places in five years. Here's the problem, though. So many people get hung up on on plans. So right. many people get hung up on goals, and that's why people always ask me, "What are your goals? Like, what's your long-term goals, and what are you doing?" I'll be honest with you. I don't set long long-term goals as far as like super specific things because it's dangerous for me because life happens to me faster than I'm able to accomplish my goals. And, but I'm so stubborn, I'll get stuck on the path of trying to accomplish that goal. So I learned early on that I just need to kind of know how I want to feel in what I'm doing and, and what my lifestyle needs to look like and feel like. And as long as my career is supporting that, then I need to be flexible to jump on different opportunities. I didn't yeah, think we were ever gonna great. get back into YouTube. It was never the plan. Um, the opportunity presented itself and we looked at it and said, hey, this is a great way to do what we love and, and um, continue once you start creating media, you've, you've felt this, um, you want to get better at it. No. You want to you hone that craft and, and just continue to get better. So it's something I'm passionate about is creating media and, and creating, you know, we're working on a cartoon series. We're working on um, a bunch of stuff that people don't realize. It's so funny because when people meet us or see us, they're like, hey, there's the truck guys. Yep. the Diesel Brothers. And they're the guys that did the funny pranks and this and that. It's, I love being underestimated. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. And I don't even know if it's underestimation. It's just people don't know until yeah. all of a sudden we come out swinging with a $250 million dollar electric truck company. Jeez, or, guy, don't give it away. Or, or, or a cartoon that's like dialed in or these, like we have so many things going on behind the scenes that this is an exciting time for, for me and for all of us because all the stuff we've been working on and going through all the painful stuff over the last few years is finally kind of starting to come to a head and we're starting to release and and announce a couple of these big things and uh it's exciting it's cool it's cool That's to awesome. see it's like you know you got you're talking about um with, with wisdom diesel the the youtube priority ranking of the last 10 videos yeah and when you see a video go out and it's a 10 out of 10 and you're just like oh it controls you but at the same time it drives me um and that same type of thing is i love releasing things and if they even if they fail it's like great I'm just going to use that as a measuring stick. Like that's, mm. that's, that's just an opportunity for me to know. And one YouTube specifically, it's hard to use that as an exact measuring tool because just because a video ranked differently doesn't always mean that the next one that's a similar theme is going to do the exact same thing. Like yeah. there's always that magic sauce in the YouTube algorithm that just surprises the shit out of you. Yep. That like, happens. You don't know. Yeah. The uh, podcasts are totally different than I was used to vlogs where yeah. you get all your views right away. Right. Uh, podcasts are so different. Like they just go in waves. Really? Yeah, it's so mm -hmm. strange. But like predictable waves? No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. I'll just see a video. It's like, eh, that's cool. And then like, I'll check it. I'm like, oh, it has like a huge spike right now. Well, it's because when it comes to a podcast, the only leverage you have in a thumbnail and a title is how popular the guest is. For the most the part. Thumbnails are tougher. Way tougher. Especially with uh, a whole group. Right. My you podcast can say it, man. Up. You can say it. My face brings zero value. That's what he was trying <laughs> to say. I was only going to use you. He looked, at my, he looked <laughs> just me hands. right in the eyes. He was like, it's just hard. There's just no way. There's thumbnail. no value here. Uh, no, it is tough. Like, it is. You can't show anything. Right. Like we're sitting at a table. Yep. So it's like I'm relying on your face and yeah. that center image. Right. You know? So are you, you going to play with that? Though? Are gonna, are, what are you going to do? I mean, you're, you're Roman Atwood. You're going to figure out how to, how to dial that process in because everybody's doing pretty much the same thing. Yeah. You talk, you look at Logan's podcast, all the yeah. podcasts are doing kind of the same thing. It's a picture of the guys and the guest or whatever. There's got to be room for improvement. There's got to be, right? Got to figure it out. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what that is. I, so on one of our podcasts, one of our bigger ones, we did an interview with a guy named Ed, you know, Ed Milet. 
So Ed Milet. Yeah, of course. Ed's a, Ed's yeah. a good buddy of mine. And I did a. a you just at his house, right? Or somebody? He was at our house. Yeah. He was oh, that's your house. We did, we did go to his house too. We, we recorded an episode at his house. And I just saw you fly in the chopper. Yeah. So he was a, he was in town for an event hanging out with us. Um, but so I did an interview with Ed and I knew that a sitting down thumbnail was not going to perform well. So I actually, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's a, it's a, I took elements of the story that Ed told us. Um, and we haven't posted a lot of our podcast content on YouTube yet. Just a few videos here and there because yeah. just haven't. It's, it's, it's on the list. We're going to get to it. It's on the um, sitting. But I'm like, sitting. I don't want, like, this is a big, compelling interview. It was an interview that you've never heard, a side of Ed you've never heard. Mm -hmm. We're sitting on his back porch and he's like getting emotional with us. So I'm like, I got to get a lot of people to see this. Yeah. So we put a lot of uh, time in the, into the thumbnail and it was, he told us a story about how he almost got in a fight with Mike Tyson one time. And so it's like Mike Tyson holding him, um, kind of like yelling in his face and then like a, a, a fake Mercedes car in the background, that, which is obviously fake. And it's another story that Ed told us. So I tried to take the most wild elements of the stories that he told us in the interview and embellish them into a thumbnail. And it worked okay. I mean, it got, for a podcast channel that doesn't get a ton of views, it got half a million views pretty quick. And so it worked, it, it worked way oh. better than some of the other thumbnails of like, podcast title and guest. I know, it is such like a trap. It is. It's, Are you, you making know. all your own thumbnails? No, I have a I have a guy and uh, I have a guy making them, and it's completely random. I was just starting this podcast without this guy, yeah. and he just started taking my thumbnails and making them better and sending them to me. I have those guys too, right? And I was like, Yeah, I think I'm going to use this thumbnail. Yeah, and I just switch it. Yep, uh -huh. and he'd be like, Dude, thanks for using my thumbnail. And then yeah. eventually, I'm like, Dude, let me throw you some cash. Right, make me some thumbnails. Be and, my guy. Yeah, and he's like so loyal and hmm. ready. Love that. Yeah, man. yeah it's just cool. super cool. I, and I love the way they look, actually. Right. They look real clean yeah. and, and fancy. And they're not just the typical podcast thumb. They're colored and they right. look good. But you're right. right. How do you how do you get eyeballs? Because on a on a vlog, you could really cheat it. You can really yeah. get something exciting in there. Mm -hmm. How often did you rotate through thumbnails when you were vlogging? Like, did you ever change thumbnails once they were up? Never. Never. I wonder if the podcast side of it might be an opportunity to get strategic with that because you're going to have your core viewers, right? You got 400,000 subscribers right now that are going to wait for this. Yeah. And you need to get right to the meat and potatoes of what this interview is about and then hit them right off the bat with, Hey, here's who I'm with. Here's what we're talking about. And they see a standard thumbnail, like what you have now. And then maybe this is a th the thought that I had had is within a week or two later, change that thumbnail to something a little bit more embellished and a little bit more exotic so that the people who aren't subscribed to your channel mm -hmm. see a picture of a flying unicorn with your face and his face. And they're like, wait, what's that story? I want I to hear that see story. see that podcast. Yeah. 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 Cool yeah. Podcast. I like, I want to hear that story. And I did switch one yeah. on the podcast so far and it did give it a, a little juice. It might be something yeah. where you actually have a little bit of a rhythm of bumping them out mellow and then getting new viewers. Getting them crazier over Dude, time. It is a full-time art. Yep. If you can master oh, YouTube. Yeah. yeah. And it changes so fast that by the time you've mastered it, there's something else. Right. Well, I think I think shorts are gonna help a ton. Like the way everyone's pushing shorts now, I think that's gonna drive the well, whole thing. Well, they're definitely YouTube gonna scene. help the podcast up yeah. because you'll yeah. have compelling parts Clips. of interviews. Yeah. Yeah. You can, we just started our shorts channel this week. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. I think those are gonna be those are gonna be key. Yeah, that's what we're trying to get our guys to do too, is push shorts right now. Yeah, and YouTube's about to That's where my attention spans at anyway. Dude, they're putting you, like 49% of their ad spend on shorts starting yeah. January 1st. So it's, it's, I don't know how I feel about that. That's crazy. It's dude. crazy because dude. it's, they've got the, obviously everybody's got TikTok in their sites, right? Yeah. Do we want YouTube to become TikTok? I want anything but TikTok. Uh, right? Get rid of TikTok. That's dude. what I'm saying. Dude. What a I'm scumbag so company. Feel the same way. You, so I feel weird. so empty and so numb after watching TikTok for, I, I was, I was into it for a while. Like I, I had, I had, a I page. remember seeing all your dances. Yeah. Yeah. All my yeah. Dance, I was big into it. And I was like, I was like putting a lot of effort into those dances. Um, but no, it's, 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 uh, you'd scroll through it and it was at first it was entertaining for the first few months. I was like, wow, I've never seen people act like this before. This is goofy. It's like, yeah. it's like America's funniest home videos. Yeah. But then you started seeing it shift into people's reality. Have you ever met a TikToker in life? A real, a real life like it, big TikToker? Not, just my wife, dude. Bro. Just my wife. Real life How big TikTokers it? are, I'm not speaking for all of them, but. Easy way you say she's right there. Bro, it's a different breed. It's a very, uh, the experiences I've, I've had have been very uncomfortable. Mm. Um, they're not real people. They, they 
if they have a, a, an expression or a reaction or something that they want to do, it's this. And then they're like looking at you and then they're doing this. <laughs> it is the most bizarre. I've been to concerts with some, some TikTokers and they are not enjoying the show. They are putting on a show, pretending like they're enjoying the show. And you're starting to see that come through the screen mm. and you're seeing how not genuine it is. And that's why I just feel like garbage after I scroll through TikTok for another, you know, for five minutes now. God, there I was, 45 <laughs> minutes later, couldn't get off. <laughs> That's what he's trying man. to say. Yeah, it's just know. desensitized you to everything. It's like it's like eating the frosting of a cake, just all the frosting and nothing oh, else. So good. Oh. <laughs> You've seen the guy talk about how, uh, like, you know, TikTok's owned by China. Right. And you, I heard this guy talking about, like, how genius TikTok is it's by, like, brilliant. destroying our country. Yep. Yeah. Like, from the inside out. Mm -hmm. It's like in China, TikTok features um, guys and inventors and, and, and guys that are creating a better China. Right. Where in America they feature these silly dances and yep. pure stupidity. The more stupid, the more viral. Right. Right. So we're all just programmed. Well, if I do this, I'll go viral. But the problem is the people don't think they're being stupid now. Yeah. Big TikTokers honestly think that they're being talented. Yeah. And that's the scariest part is they're doing nothing. They're doing absolutely, they're lip syncing to, to, to. Do you think that's like actually China's plan? Uh, I think I don't think they I don't think they're smart enough to know that would happen. But you don't think, think that, China's smart enough? I think it's a happy accident. I think they knew that Americans would consume dumbed down content, like you know the girls dancing and that type of stuff. That's why they allow so much of it. I don't know if they knew that America would essentially become the idiots that they were acting like on TikTok. I think that was a bonus for them. But if you read into like the terms and conditions. Have you read that on TikTok? Oh yeah. It is terrifying. It's deep. They are in your files. They are yeah, dude. deep in. And, but we're all like, okay. That's yeah, fine. So they're not, okay. they're not looking at me. Why? Don't know, man. It's still on my phone. I should delete it today, but I haven't yet. I, I actually have been leaning towards it more and more. Um, and especially the way it makes me feel now. Like just the, like anybody watching this, Go scroll through TikTok for 15 or 20 minutes yeah. and then put your phone down and think about how you feel. It's a dirty place, dude. I think we can all agree that TikTok is you need to get a handle on it. Like if you're, if you're, if you're deep in that, just consuming that content you should probably, I really yeah. do want to think about this for a second because I'm worried my daughter, she's uh 10. She turned 10 this, this, this week actually. Um, and I don't give, she doesn't have a phone mm. and I don't want her to consume that. Her cousins uh, that are kind of roughly her same age are on there a lot. And I see the difference between the way that they talk and act versus the way that she talks and act. And so Personally, I have a lot of control over my own kids, right? I can control what they're seeing and, and, and consuming, but there's there's a lot of kids out there whose parents either don't know what TikTok is and they don't even realize what their kids are watching. But bro, it is, uh, there's a doctor, uh, guy named Dr. Daniel Amen. You ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. Daniel Amen is like a world famous brain doctor. He has these places called Amen Clinics all over the world. And he told me, well, he not told me, he's taught this principle that's stuck with me forever. And it's called drip. Is don't, this the foreign guy? No. Not Dr. Funny. Amen is. What am I uh, thinking of? Um, oh, it doesn't matter. The guy that you said follows you on Instagram. Dr. Amen yeah. follows me on Instagram. Yeah. I do know who he is. <laughs> yeah, you should. So, Dr. Amen, Dr. Amen is is a wizard. Dude, he, he's he understands awesome. the brain. He has the Amen Brain Clinic. You go to the clinic, you get your head scanned, and it shows you all the differences in where blood's flowing. Got but it. He, he preaches um, something about ADD. Well, he talks a lot about ADD. I have ADD. Mm -hmm. um, I've never allowed myself to be diagnosed by it. My mom wouldn't let me either when I was a kid, but. Um, as somebody who has a short attention span or somebody who's a thrill seeker, you're constantly looking for dopamine. Yeah. Right. Uh, and he, he teaches drip, don't dump dopamine. So ways of dumping dopamine, going to get drunk, taking illicit drugs, um, pornography, these different things are just, they're dumping dopamine. And what happens is you have these dopamine receptors in your brain that they, they're basically like punching bags. The more you punch them, the more they get worn out. They start to get fatigued and they, can, they can't literally pick up as much of the chemical. They can't, the, the receptors don't work as well. Um, and the more you release tons of dopamine, the more your brain starts to become kind of immune to it is the best way to put it. The receptors can't, like I said, absorb it. And so I'm afraid that's what's happening with TikTok is it's, it's designed to dump as much dopamine as, as quickly as possible. Because if you watch it, you, I guarantee you could scroll through your feed right now and within two or three or five videos, five videos max, you'd find something that you would watch and you would either be laughing at them, yeah. with them, entertained by it, whatever it is, and you're dumping that dopamine. And that's what kids are doing all day long, scrolling through, waiting for that next thing that's going to be a dump, 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 And then the concept of, of uh, you don't pick what you're seeing 
creates this mindset of, well, what's the next swipe, mm -hmm. right? What's the next swipe? Yep. You're always playing the lottery. Mm -hmm. You're just this addiction of what's next. Yep. Which is mm -hmm. why I think I feel personally so empty after I watch it because I literally just poked my dopamine receptors like over and over and over again with these dumb little gimmicky things. Yeah. And it's it's going to create, I think, the, <laughs> I think there's a massive wave of depression coming. And it's from the current technology that our kids are using and then they have access to. I think we're all all aware yeah. of the dangers mm -hmm. of this app. We're not the, apps. We're not all aware. I, dude, I think we're just in denial. Yeah. I think we'd rather have the dopamine. Do you think the younger gen generation really understands though? Probably not. I don't no way. Do. But, but, no we know, way. but we know how bad sugar is for us. We still consume it all day. Yeah. Right. It's an it's, addiction. It's addicting. It's it's just more fun. Yeah. It's like us humans, we like fun. Yeah. And we choose it over health. We choose it over what's right for us. Yeah. We choose. It's dangerous. Yep. So what seems innocent in this fun little app is, dude, I, I can't stand it. That's why I have more respect for YouTube viewers, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Because YouTube viewers, just like YouTube creators, they pay their dues. And they'll watch a 30 to 45 minute video or a vlog or something. And it's not all super exciting, but they're going to pay their dues and they're on the journey with you. That's why, like I said, I, I, I cater to that platform right now and I try to talk to that platform because I have respect for those people. Yeah. And it's funny because there's this weird beef between YouTube viewers and TikTok viewers. I don't know if you've seen it in the comment section, but they're, they're like two different tribes and they don't mix. Now, there's a lot of crossover, I'm sure, but when yeah. it comes to like the comments and the way the YouTube... Um, lifestyle and the YouTube kind of overall mentality is much different than the TikTok mentality. So how do you educate the TikTokers? Um, educate them about the drip. <laughs> you did the stuff like this and you hope they, you hope eventually, I think what happens is people will become numb to, they're not going to get that, that release anymore on TikTok. And so they're going to look for other outlets and hopefully YouTube can attract them with the shorts and the, that can the, bring them. The other side of it is TikTok's the first place that, uh, you can go viral with anything, yeah. right? You don't need to be good at anything to go viral on TikTok. You just got to produce content mm -hmm. of any kind and lots of it. So this is the first time uh, as a YouTuber, you had to be creative. You had to create viral content. You had to go out, risk your life in the streets, pulling a prank, right? right. Now you can do anything, and you can become more viral than the guy that's been grinding for the last 10 years right. on YouTube. But the value of that virality is not. But it doesn't no matter comparison. to the youth because they just see numbers. Mm -hmm. How many numbers do you have? Imagine being in school right now right. and you've got three followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely looked at differently. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's scary. It it's, really is. I it's, hate It's like that. a Black Mirror. Have you seen Black Mirror, the, the show on Netflix? No, I haven't. It's no. where they have like a real life social credit score. Like you can see people's like clout. Do we have that head. right we do. now? 100%. 100%. Mm -hmm. Imagine being that kid. It sucks, dude. Now you looked at me. You looked at me and you said that. Yeah. <laughs> imagine Once being again, that Once again, you guys kid. are, bro, can singling me out. That can you kid, imagine that, only that, having that resource kid? Imagine, imagine you grew up, like we grew up with just the popular kid was like, he was cool. He was good at things. He was smart. He was, exactly. He was something else. Now it's just how many followers do you have? Yep. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard uh, Gary Vee talk about that app he wants to design that's you can only post once a day and how much more important each post would be and like how like you they would actually time. have meaning you put and effort. time and effort. Yeah. Well, that was daily vlogging. Yeah. Posted yeah. once a day, you put time and effort. The problem is it's 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 not easy and quick. Yeah. It's not, you don't get that quick release. Um, so that's one. So this whole thing we're talking about right now, right? Um what our generation, our, our younger generation is up against, what they're facing. I don't claim to be a, a guru by any means. Um, I'm a guy who wasn't very well educated, like I dropped out of college, like I said, and uh, I just started listening to people that made sense. Because when someone talks mm -hmm. and, and what they're saying is true, deep down inside, we usually know it and we mm -hmm. can feel if that's good for us or not. So luckily I was drawn to more and more of that. I was listening to, to, and it was, this was, you know, 10, 15 years ago before TikTok and before really viral was a thing. Um, I was just listening to more and more of this content. And I realized that the more of the good stuff I listened to, and I'd, I'd make a little, you know, list and I'd follow these, these things. Like the first thing we were talking about was the secret. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to the movie, the secret when I was 22, I think. And when he sat me down to watch it, I was just like, oh, this is weird. Like, <laughs> all right, this is hocus pocus, but whatever. Like, he's, he's a kid that I trusted, and I, I really, really, you know, had confidence that he wasn't going to lead me astray. Halfway through The Secret, I'm like, dude, 
this is it. This is this is how this is this explains how and why I've been able to accomplish so much in my life. Because um, if you're not familiar with the secret, uh, for anybody watching this, essentially talks about the law of attraction, right? Um, what thoughts become things, and uh, I think that is one of the most understated, um, you know, principles in our generation. Is, is kids don't understand that what they're thinking about and what they're constantly watching and viewing is what they're becoming. So that's why the TikTok thing is so scary. So we, uh, with our podcast, when we launched it, we tried to talk about um, in a very normal way, just like you would with a friend, what sorts of little things you can do to uh, kind of break away from what everybody else is doing and start to take those steps to further yourself. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, I believe, and I truly do believe this, that an episode of our podcast, the one we were doing, like releasing um, checklist items of, of personal development goals, one episode of that, if you followed every item in it, was more valuable than a couple semesters of college. Because <laughs> I really believe that because the things that you're learning are things that are going to make you better at college. Yeah. They're, they're going to make you a better person. They're going to make you, life's all about self-control and discipline. I, the, the, when you think about, you strip everything away, Life is about discipline. It's, 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 it's being able to control what decisions you make, what thoughts you think, what interactions you have, and do it in a way that is beneficial not only for you, but for the people around you. People don't know how to do that anymore. Dude, it's so hard. Discipline is, I, I agree 1000%. So that's why you have to break it down though, because when you hear self-discipline, it's, that's a scary, it's a weird word. It's scary. Yeah. It's a lot. It's, you instantly start to think like, oh, guilt. Um, you feel, you feel ashamed. You feel like you'd never be able to do it. You look at people that are way disciplined, the guys like Jocko and those guys, like I can never be that. And, and so you shy away from it because you're afraid you could never become it. Mm. Um, but I, I, I am a big believer that discipline starts in very tiny little steps and it starts mm. all across the board in different areas. So if we start training ourselves to do hard things, then we start doing great things without even realizing it. Um, and it's, I'm telling you the dumbest little things. Some of the stuff we preached on our, on our show was the first episode we talked about, take a cold shower. Do you do ice baths or anything? I've done cold showers. They're the worst. It is so <laughs> tough. Yeah. Cold I did one this week. Yeah. Nice. This week. Once, yeah. Once a week. I did one this week. I did not do one last week. You know what's funny <laughs> well, it's is Monday, it, isn't it? So you're after a good start. <laughs> Uh, to me, a cold shower is actually harder than the ice bath because it's just mm -hmm. annoying. It just kind of like, it's, you're supposed to be comfortable in the shower, right? You're supposed yeah. to be warm and then you got that cold water raining on you. Um, but cold water or cold showers and ice baths, we preach that. Dude, within two or three weeks of releasing that episode, we had people, I had people coming to me and I'm talking kids like yeah. my age and, and like between 18 and 35 that are like, dude, why didn't I know this earlier? Like, Freaking game I just started doing this and it's like, I'm like, okay, well, what are you noticing? Like, what, what, what sorts of benefits are you having? And the responses were all over the board, all over the place. And it, every single one of them was different and every single one of them was positive. Yeah. Some of it, but ultimately what it boiled down to is they were forcing themselves to do something hard that was good for them. And that was building those mental muscles to be able to do the next hard thing. Yep. The next hard thing for the younger generation might be stop scrolling through TikTok. Only be on there for five minutes instead of 25 minutes or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So as you start training yourself to do these little hard things, you start getting that drip of dopamine. Yep. But they're big, powerful drips that last with you. They stick with you. Mm -hmm. They're not these dumps that you just feel empty afterwards. So um, I think it's very important that anybody listening to this, you, you have a lot of younger kids who watch this. I mean, you, dude, your viewership is all over the place because you've it's, been doing this for so long. It's mainly 17 to 40, yeah. I would say it's, it's adults. And that's where, that's who this advice I would say is most pertinent to. Yeah. It's, um, dude, I don't know if you ever just set your phone down and do something. It wow. feels amazing. amazing. Yeah. Dude, I go into pure panic cause I'm afraid he's trying to get a hold of me. <laughs> it is true. so disturbing how connected yeah. to my phone I am. Yep. Like I'm so guilty of it. But even physically, like the feel of it in your pocket, if it's not in your yeah. pocket, you have this as long weird as it's like- near me, yeah. on me, if I'm yep. laying in bed, it's here. Yep. Dude, it's gross. Yeah, it is gross. So that's <clears> one thing we talked about on the show is, is um, don't, when you wake up in the morning, most people grab their phone and they get into it. Whether they're looking at a text or an email, but a lot of people unfortunately jump on social media. If you are doing that, if you are opening your phone, like first of all, just don't touch your phone at all. Yes. But if you are grabbing your phone, do not go to social media before you go have breakfast. Take, leave your phone on your nightstand or wherever, leave it plugged in and go have 
15 or 20 minutes to yourself and watch how different your life is. Bro, it is insane. Facts. I started doing it. Yeah. Because I I got to the point where it's like, I'm not getting up on social media, but I would get up and read my texts and emails. Yep. And you instantly get all this this huge cortisol release and you just become stressed. You start your day off with a Dude, huge, it puts a big blanket on top of you on bed. Exactly. It just weighs you down. Yep. So that's, that's I'm just going to start spitting out some advice, things, things that, do it. that we have learned and and have really helped us. Let's get motivated. Don't check your phone mm-hmm. um, until after breakfast. Um, try to take a cold shower. Even if you start your shower warm and then end it for 10, 15 seconds, the whole purpose behind that is start trying to do hard things. Make yourself uncomfortable, yeah. intentionally uncomfortable. And and just try it. Just if, if somebody listening to this is like, this is stupid. Why would it's I do this? It's the worst thing ever. Just do it for a week yeah. and try it for at least a minute. And see how you feel. And see how you feel. Who's if you that uh, Iceman? Uh, Wim Hof. Wim Hof, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I love I'm a that big guy. Wim Hofer. This guy eats, we'd sleep, watch, breathes Dude, we watch Hoff. his documentaries. I have Wim Hof events at my, at my facility where we have his instructors come in and teach us to breathe. We all do ice baths. And that's where I was like, oh my gosh, I feel good. I feel different than I felt. Like this is this is this is a, a pure kind of joy and yeah. happiness. Yeah, and it, it is. It's yeah. Wim I don't Hoff, know why we're not taught these things. I don't either, and that's why that's why I do what I do. Our podcast, we never monetized it. We never did anything. I just wanted to talk about this stuff because it changed my life and made me feel so good in ways that I hadn't felt good in a while. It's a fulfilling awesome. kind of good. Yeah. Um, so there's I've got a whole list of different things, but the the key ones are are those plus, oh, there's so many of them. Uh, the other the kind of final thing I want to talk about as far as personal development goes is the thought thing and what you're thinking about and, and what it becomes. Um, you know what a vision board is? Vision board. Vision board. Vis- oh, of course. So it's it's almost cliche. It's, it's mm-hmm. the, People talk about it so much. It's But if you don't yeah. have a vision board, you should definitely have a vision board. And it's, it's easy enough to just put it on your phone. Guess what's on my vision board? A Blackhawk. It's been on there for a while and actually hasn't been on there that long. As soon as I put it on there, things happened quickly. Boom. So I, like I said earlier, I have to be careful with what I put on my board because it comes, it's become something that I'm obsessed with and I have to accomplish it. But um, take time with that vision board. If, uh, if you have it on your phone or whatever, spend five to 10 minutes a day. Here's where the magic lies. Looking through those pictures, make a slideshow out of it, whatever. And then uh, here's the real secret sauce. As you're looking at those pictures, try to experience the emotion that you're going to feel when you have that thing. So a good example of that is when I first flew a helicopter when I was 21, I went to a training school and I thought I wanted to be a pilot and greatest thing in the world. Uh, couldn't afford school, so I didn't I didn't enroll. But after that, I would drive down the road in my truck and I had uh, my hand right here um, as if it was on the cyclic mm-hmm. and one hand down here on the collective. So I had imaginary controls. And I would drive my truck down the road based off these imaginary <laughs> controls. And I would only do it when I was alone because I felt crazy. But I would, I would actually like, I would like kind of daydream off to the point where like I'd fly over a family party and they'd see me in my helicopter. <laughs> and dude, I, when, you, when, awesome. you, when you create these very vivid scenarios, mm-hmm. you start to feel the very vivid emotions. When you feel those emotions, I would, I would dare say that that speeds up the process of accomplishing that goal a thousand percent, yep. if not more. Yeah, I've heard you've got to... You've got to look at this image as if you already have it. But that's a hard thing to that's a hard thing to explain. The, yeah. You got to break that down because it's the most powerful tool you have is your brain and your emotions. Mm-hmm. So take those emotions and quit using them for for things that are hurting you and use them for things that are like super super beneficial to you and it, it's going to feel weird and awkward at first, but it's no different than dra- daydreaming when we were kids, like dreaming about the cute girl or the cool toy or whatever it was. And you think about it for a second, kids uh, have a much more pure form of it. I, I watch it in my son all the time. I, my five-year-old son is like identical to me. And I see him dream up all these crazy machines and stuff that he wants to build. And I see him actually like feeling the emotion of those machines. And I know that he is well on his way to accomplishing those goals because it's exactly what I did. Mm. So if you can take those images, the, the easiest, most simple, because the hard part about some of this is where do you start? Like, yep. where do I go? Easiest way to do it is grab one thing that you want. Make it a physical thing, uh, whether it's a car, truck, helicopter, dog. Put it on your phone, look at it, and then start creating scenarios of you interacting with that thing. And maybe the first two or three scenarios aren't going to click. They aren't going to feel like good to you. But I'm telling you, 
uh, this is very specific, but the one scenario for my helicopter thoughts and daydreaming was um, UB40, uh, that song, uh, The Way You Do The Thing You Do. For some reason, that song was like my helicopter song in my head. So I would I would hear that song playing. I would picture me flying over a family party and picking up family members. And I just pictured how fun it would be and how cool I would look. And, and it was this whole scenario that I would play out in my head two, three times a week. And bro, I am not a kid that should have ever been able to buy a helicopter. Three, four years after I started doing that, I bought my first helicopter and it was a turbine helicopter. It was not like... It was, it was a cool helicopter. It was one I could actually go fly with my family. Yeah. And um, I'll get in there and I'll put it in UB40 and my family will, I will fly around and I feel the exact same emotions that I felt when I was imagining it. In fact, the, the imagination moments in some ways are better because wow. it's just when you're, when you're in a bad situation, but you can emotionally feel the accomplishment of a goal that is not even remotely attainable at that time, bro, that's, that's, I think that's probably the quickest way to cure depression and mm. uh, stagnation when people feel like they're stuck and they can't accomplish their goals, just take something and live it. Even if you're years from having it, it's, it's powerful shit, dude. And if you, beautiful. If, if you break it down, it's, it's, that's how I've gotten everything that I've got. And that's where I've learned how to flex that muscle, that power of, uh, you know, positive thinking and, and law of uh, attraction and manifesting things. Um, and I have become literally whatever I think it becomes mine down to the very color and size and everything that I want almost immediately. Yeah, you get, right? you yeah, get to the point where you got to be careful. These guys, these guys have watched want. it. This is not just me <laughs> saying, ooh, I get what I want. It's yeah. like. It's scary. I, it's scary, I, actually. I, yeah, I, I, I feel the emotions and, and, and make it happen. And anybody can do it. It's not just me. Anybody yeah, can do it. Of course. Um, I think you're doing it right now with the podcast, yeah. right? You are happy. You're loving this. Every time you, the channel grows, I see you pumped about posting about 400,000 subscribers. You're feeling that emotion. That's the same emotion you're going to feel when the channel has 10 million subscribers yeah. and 20 million. And, and that's why it's growing so fast. So it's okay to celebrate your victories early. I, in fact, it, it's encouraged. I yeah. think people should do it more often because it's just going to accelerate that process. And this is not mystic voodoo crazy stuff. This is, I think, you know, you could go to Joe Dispenza, you know, Dr. Joe's, Joe Dispenza. Yeah, he follows him. Yeah, he probably, yeah, he probably follows him. Yeah. He's probably been trying to get on your show. <laughs> anyway, Dude, I'm so bad with names. And oh, if I see a face, I'm like, boom. Dr. God. Joe Dispenza talks about the, like, the quantum physics behind how this actually works and how there's frequencies out there in the world that you're radiating. Um, but if you don't understand all that, go the dumb guy route, which is me. And I'll just, you just help you paint a picture and feel those emotions. And bro, it's, it's magic. You did a great way explaining that. Um, we spend so much time. The, the hard balance is not being negative, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like negativity can eat up so much time, True. so much of your day. Um, also, the music I've noticed that we listen to can affect your entire mood. Yeah, your entire mood. This music that you love, it may be bringing you down yep. without you even knowing it. Yep. That's just how you want to be, man. But really, a good song will bring you way up. You know, the happiest I've ever been was when I, I set a rule for myself that. Before noon, I wouldn't listen to anything but classical music. Mm. And it was because I grew up listening to classical in my house. My mom like educated us on a little bit. And so um, not a lot of kids would even understand that nowadays. But God. if you find uplifting music and you listen to it in the early part of your day, scientifically, like there's research that shows that you're going to be significantly more productive than if you were to listen to stuff that has more condescending beats and condescending lyrics. And those lyrics don't just go in one ear and out the other. They don't. They bounce around in there oh. and they become thoughts. So it's, it's so somebody else's word went into your head, became a thought that which that thought is now beginning to become an emotion. So you are feeling something and then creating something that you didn't even want to. Yeah. Wild. It, it, dude, so you have to be that's careful. Where, that's where discipline comes in. This makes a lot more sense because I just thought I listened to garbage music in the mornings. I'm like, this <laughs> no. is the weirdest genre at eight o'clock in the morning. I've but it all makes sense. Well, now. what's funny is while I was sleeping on the trailer at the shop, he actually invited me to go up to church with him one Sunday and he taught that lesson to the youth about classical music and about mm. filling your mind with good thoughts of yeah. uh, early in the day. So I started doing it and it, the vibe throughout the day was totally different. I think we've all so. just become numb to convenience. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the phone in the morning, it's so easy to just grab it. I do it all the time. And you're right, super weight. Yeah. As soon as you wake up and there's just something, there's always going to be something. How often do you get embarrassed? Me? Yeah. Mm, it's hard to embarrass me. That's yeah. a good thing. And that's the reason why I ask that is because you should work on embarrassing yourself. 
mm. to yourself. And the way you do that is by doing these goofy things that I was telling you that I do. Like take a practice that seems way left field or way right field, wherever it is, and try it and just do it for yourself. Yeah. And it might sound like it's, it, it could be something that's so weird that you don't even feel comfortable telling your wife yet. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that I experiment with and try with that I wouldn't tell anybody until it's like, I'm comfortable with it, but there's <laughs> like been a what? lot of stuff. Like, give us an example. Uh, the classical music thing in the morning was a good one. Um, another one is the, um, uh, <laughs> there's a, I just need some dirt. Um, um, uh, primal, primal screaming. Um, basically, uh, you, that's what like, that sound is. Yeah. It's like a form of meditation <laughs> and you, and you scream, um, you basically with like your whole heart and soul and lung and everything. Where do like you that. do this at? He did it in, in the bathroom sauna? this morning on the flight. <laughs> I was like, "What the hell? Is that guy's having some problems?" Yeah, so go, Google primal primal screaming. It's it's I've a heard really good exercise. Did you say it on the flight? On the flight, he was in the bathroom screaming at the top of his lungs, and I was like, "Gonna go and ask for assistance," and he's like, "No, this is my time." Yeah, and I was like, "All right, moment here. this yeah. is my time." Um, <laughs> some of the some of the breathing techniques are a little bit weird at first when you start trying those. I started doing those. Um, and then I didn't like doing them around people at first, but now I don't care. Like uh, the Wim Hof breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can do, um, there's a, oh shoot, what's it called? There's like a hol holotropic breathing, which is basically you get high on your own breath. And I've, I've been there. I've done that. Like I've had full blown like DMT releases, hallucinations. Wow. Yeah. Just from breathing. So um, that's called infection. Yeah, <laughs> that might be called delirium. Supply. No, it's the, the most clarity I've ever had in my entire life. And the most, uh, the most, uh, some of the most beneficial things I've ever done and the areas where I've gone to be able to get the most insight and be able to see things the most clearly. It's literally like you can release the same things as like a psychedelic drug in your brain from just breathing. That's what Wim Hof teaches, right? Yeah, he, he teaches yeah. that. So he his breathing starts with the basics of learning just how to get kind of lightheaded and mm -hmm. then you take it further and further as you start advancing that and you can really change your whole physiology from wow. just by breathing, yeah. So that's one thing that I would, I would recommend. It's easy, it's free. You don't have to have any money. Anybody listening to this, if you don't have any money, Go go learn Wim Hof breathing. Go get high. Go get high on your own <laughs> supply. That's, that's what that's what Wim Hof <laughs> says all the time. So I did, I do things like this regularly that mm. are embarrassing to me. And if it's embarrassing to me, I know that it's a it's a worthy effort. And not everything that I that embarrasses me or makes me feel uncomfortable is something that I pursue. Yeah. But I'll at least try it. And that's why that embarrasses me. If I try it, I'm like, oh, that was dumb. That was weird. I'm not going to do that again. That's how I know I'm on the right path. Mm. So it's kind of goes along the lines of doing those hard things. Um, but I think. The biggest issue is a lot of us just get stuck feeling like we're good, mm -hmm. right? We're just complacent. Well, it's easier. Way easier. Way easier to grab the Red Bull, but grab I, the phone, yeah. grab the blanket, watch Netflix, yeah. yep. zero discipline, and just binge. Yep. That's mm -hmm. easy. But I'm here to tell you it's way more fun and way more fulfilling to do the hard to stuff. try this hard stuff. Well, the fulfillment part is the uh, the part you got to get to. Like you got to get there. Mm -hmm. The and, nice thing is, I the, the, so what I preach is these little, quick, easy things that you can do and feel that fulfillment, or at least a taste of it, mm -hmm. within a matter of minutes, hours, or a couple of days. Um, greater fulfillment comes from doing this stuff long term and staying disciplined and, yep. and, and with it. But um, there's so many things that you can do that are like little mental exercises that you can you can feel something mm -hmm. that you haven't felt ever before or you haven't felt in a long time by just changing your physiology and just putting yourself in these in these different exercises. So um, I, I have a list I can send to you of, of different little things that I've done, but it's fun, man. It's experiment with yourself. It's awesome. Rather than experimenting with drugs, which I mean, I'm not saying that people, I'm not saying that hallucinogenics are bad because um, I think they help <laughs> a lot of people, but the problem with the drug is it's like, Give me that experience and, and make it happen to me rather than you going out and saying, I want this experience. I want to make this happen for myself for because I think we have the ability to bring that stuff. We're so much more powerful than we realize. Oh my gosh, man. Yeah. It, it's a drug creating success for your family. Yeah. Like that's a real drug. 100%. Like I, I love the idea of creating success. Yep. For my kids, my wife. But it's myself. that's a whole, that's like, a big intimidating thing. It's... It, I think I think that's where the, you got to find what you love. You yeah. got to find like it's so true. I don't know how to mm -hmm. I don't my, know how to hand that to somebody. My mission president taught us there's no growing in a comfort zone. There's no comfort in a growing zone, right? And so he's just like always just be uncomfortable. It's the biggest thing you can do to grow. Yeah, my dad always tells me to yeah. get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if you're comfortable, comfort's your enemy. Yeah, right. yep. So 
that's where you see the people that have been the most influential and the most successful and that continue to stay, you know, fulfilled and happy is the people that are continuously doing those hard, hard things and not allowing like Goggins. He's a good example. Dude. Like the dude is an, an animal, animal. And, right. and he's, he will not allow himself. He, I think he's a little too far. Sometimes he won't allow himself to, to feel any amount of comfort. I mean, he just wants to push, 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 yeah. but there's a reason for that because that, that is, a, that is a much deeper, truer form of happiness and fulfillment. So it's uh, you've you've I mean, dude, you've got a <laughs> you've got a big responsibility on your shoulders right now. Mm. And I don't mean to turn the tables because you're interviewing us, but you have a huge responsibility to not only continue to provide entertainment, but these kids are looking to you for something more. Yeah, they're coming. To, people are watching your show because they want a, a drip or a dump of dopamine. Whether your guest is enjoyable to watch or he's funny or you watching you and your wife's interaction is entertaining, yeah. which all that is is true. But. Just know that that tool, this tool that you're building is the most powerful tool you've ever built. And it's going to be something that comes with great responsibility. Yeah, no, you're right. And my, do my goals, I think one thing I did provide forever was not just stupidity. I always left something inspiring. Right. I sat and I talked into that camera. Yep. I spoke to my viewer. And I think, um, well, look, I mean, look at the brand you built. We, we said, yeah, smile more. Right. We, um, I had 10 million subscribers on a prank channel. Nobody cared about me. Right. It wasn't until the vlogs, we speak to people, they learn about you, they know you, they know where your, uh, your extra paper towels are in your kitchen. Right. They know you intimately. Right. That you, you do have a responsibility. Yeah. Like, and I've always tried to use that to the best that I can. Mm -hmm. Like I never, I never have told my viewers to go buy stocks, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah what a horrible not person you are. Dirt bags. <laughs> um, you know, another fun tip that I had, and we'll wrap this up here, but uh, so many people are afraid of money or they let money control them. Um, and, and cash is king of that, you know? So a lot of people treat cash like it's this, secret treasure that mm. they have and they gotta they gotta protect it um and you see that a lot like especially with like rappers that become uh you know super successful their whole world revolves around these physical things yep uh one thing that i did to to teach myself that i'm the king of cash and cash isn't the king of me is early on when i didn't even have uh much cash like say i had a thousand dollars in the bank account I would take $500 and $500 bills and put them in my wallet and just have them there and just have them be with me and know that I could lose them. I could lose my wallet, whatever. I controlled that money. It didn't control me. And it also reminded me that um, it gave me like this sense of like abundance. Like I had enough to just carry around. It's weird how you start to train yourself that um, if it's normal to have that much, it's normal to have more. Mm. And rather than Rather than constantly... We're, like I never leave anywhere without having thousand, couple thousand dollars of cash somewhere on me. And it's because for me, I'm trying to prove to myself that money works for me in a way that it has zero control over me. Mm -hmm. It's all, it does exactly what I tell it to do. I don't do what it tells me to do. And that's, that's part of like kind of an abundance mentality. You'll see, I think there's two types of people, abundance mindset people and scarcity. You know, scarcity mindset people. They're the people yep. that think that, you know, it's it's tempting to have that mindset when you join YouTube. You're afraid that, like Whistling Diesel was saying the other day, like I was afraid to put that stuff out there because of other people are going to take it from me or they're yeah. going to start copying me. Um, unfortunately, I think that's how the majority of people are brought up is is to think that everything is is limited. Temporary. Everything that everything is not limited. Everything is unlimited. It's just a matter of how you view it. And if you, it's such a small shift, like. I intentionally give a lot more to charities um, than probably the average person because I want the universe or whoever it is to know that I know there's more where that came from. Mm. And if you start thinking like that, everything changes. It's a it's a small it's a small shift you have to start in the beginning, but dude, it becomes one of the. It's probably one of the most powerful things. Like, do I care about money? No, you really don't. It's weird. It's scary. Like he just bought a Blackhawks. I'm, yeah, for I, but I'm not, I'm not the guy's reckless got with money. Seventeen though. birds. People who don't know me might think like, "Oh, dude, he's reckless with money." I'm not. I just, I know that if I give away a million dollars for whatever good cause or whatever, whatever it is, that that money is going to become way more. And I don't have to know how it's going to happen. Mm. I just know that it's going to happen, and I just have to, I have to have the confidence that I'm going to be able to create that abundance and and you know, giving away significant amounts of money is is. Uh, it's something that, let me put it this way. If you're uncomfortable sharing what you have with others, 
you are going to be significantly less successful than you could potentially be. Mm. If you can get comfortable with giving uh, more than you're comfortable with, uh, that's going to hit kind of like that that bell curve where you're going to you're going to grow exponentially faster than you'd be able to otherwise. Yeah. Oh man, I'm all over the place with my tips and tricks. And I stuff. love it, man. I yeah. love it. I'm just I'm sitting here letting you do what I normally do, bro. I'll just go, just wing it. Yeah. D- Diesel's making fun of me at the airport today because I have because you have a pocket full of cash. A pocket full of cash. I mean, and he's I th- like, "Why do you have that?" I'm like, ah, "It's hard to explain. You just did it for me. You established dominance over it." Yeah. Wow. Well, oh, you were establishing that, dominance. Does that resonate you? with you at all? It's very that- biblical too to have charity. I mean, if yeah. you don't oh, have yeah. charity, you have nothing. Yeah, you have no. to have charity. Yeah, it's for me. Charity. And what is better like, fulfillment than? being charitable nothing there is nothing there's literally nothing just go help somebody for yep. the day you'll feel better than you have all week i tell 100%. people all the time that i that it's i feel selfish when i do charity because i'm the one that benefits from it there's a lot of truth to that but it's a i think rightfully i think, I think god's okay with that selfishness. rightfully yeah right he's, you're allowed he's, to feel good yeah yeah because yeah it's, it's it's instant too it's never even when i get burned by people these guys will yeah. to tell you that too I, I let people stick around and leech way longer than i probably should I just don't care. Like, mm-hmm. eventually they work themselves out. and That's why and we're still here, Dave. <laughs> we're still here. I, I've, I've had a lot of people come try to leech onto me, and I don't immediately get rid of them because I'm vindictive and I got to have them gone. I let them run their course and do their thing, and mm-hmm. I know that I'm going to be okay either way. And if I do what I'm supposed to do, I do my part in the relationship to try to be a good person and provide, that's all that matters. Yeah. Whatever they decide to do with that, that's on them. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to be okay because I'm going to move on to the next one, and, and I'm going to be able to make a bigger impact. And... Most people that I end on bad terms with, I don't usually end on bad terms with. Maybe they're mad for a week or two. There's only yeah. one or two people in this world that I can say that I actually am not okay with. Yeah. Other than that, I've been burned a million times, and I still call and text the people probably all the time. It's not. It's really, I get over things really quick. Forgive and forget awesome. is a powerful thing. It is. Like, because, dude, we only have so much space up here, right? You only have so much shelf space for these thoughts and feelings and emotions. Why stock it with with uh, aggravation towards somebody who burned you. Yeah. It's the hourglass yeah. technique. It's like, uh, don't worry about the sand that's already fallen. Yep. Mm-hmm. The, the sand never stops. Nope. Like once the hourglass is out, don't dwell on yep. the sand that's already dropped. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, man. Forgiveness is a tough one too. Very biblical as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, uh, I don't know, man. It's awesome. Do you want to talk about the, uh, you found out that we joined the church uh, a few years ago. This right. is this is all new. I usually don't talk religion yeah. at all, and I'm glad you are. Because but it's just recently been popping up, and uh, I don't put it on any of my viewers. I don't tell my viewers to go to church. I just right. something that I personally, we personally as a family, yeah, do behind the scenes, and uh, it's been it's been wonderful. So there's there's two different uh, kind of. Member, members of the church. There's those who were born in the church and yep. those who were converse to the church. It's really incredible that you guys were converse to the church. The backstory behind that is your family, some of them were LDS? Yeah, a lot of my uh, my father's side. Uh-huh. And um, my mother and father joined the church about the exact same age I did. Yeah. I think it was like 35, 36, 30, something like that. Your, who so did? Your, your mom? My mom and dad yeah. together. Okay. And... Um, so, they, but they never asked me to go to church. And right. it's something they did personally. Yeah. It's something that they did. And I watched their lives change. Right. And maybe it would have at any church they joined, right? But I saw a 180 from my parents. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know it was something they always wanted for me, um, but they never pushed or never asked or never, hey, you should come to church. Never. It was just something they were doing. Did other kids in the family join when they did? My brother did. Okay. My brother did. Um, I didn't. How, I don't know. How I don't old know. were you when they joined? You I said? think I was 35. Oh, geez. yeah, okay. yeah. So we were, you know, you were, were 35 or they were 35? They were 35. Oh, yeah. How you old were you? Were I was, yeah, teens. Oh. So I was just watching them join the church. Okay, yeah. mom and dad, do your thing. Right. Like, great. So for people listening, um, joining the Church of Jesus Christ is is kind of a big deal because the church has a lot of stigmas attached to it, right? Mm. Oh, um, my gosh. And this is why, this is why sometimes it's, it's, not talked about because you can't just throw around the word Mormon and then just move on. You got to be able to kind of dive into it a little bit so that people understand what it is. That's one of my biggest frustrations when I listen to like Joe Rogan's podcast. I love Joe Rogan. He's one of my favorites to listen to, but he has such a, such a anger towards Mormonism because 
um, the facts that he kind of follows are based off of the stigmas. And so yeah. that's where most people kind of mainstream when they hear Mormonism, which for those of you watching, we're not called Mormons anymore. Um, we were never officially called Mormons. It's kind of, a, was a nickname, but yeah. um, as the church kind of battens down the hatches and gets ready for darker days, which we all know are coming, um, they're sharpening things up. And so the church is the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the same church that, that we believe Jesus Christ ran while he was on, right? Yeah. Right here in, uh, when he was on the earth. But there's no church easier to make fun of. No, it's, dude. They, they, they made it popular to make fun of. Right? Absolutely. Take polygamy, mm -hmm. take Joseph Smith, take the fact yeah. that he was young, take all these different factors and things. Um, and, and rightly so, I understand. Yeah. And I, we're not even going to get into the doctrinal side no. of it, but I was born in the church. My dad was a convert to the church um, when he was 16, 17. Um, my mom's side of the family was deep, deep in the church. Like my great grandfather is partly P. Pratt, like one of the, the you know original um, guys that kind of helped bring the church back yeah. out west. Um, so I'd say I have both sides of it in me, but here's the way I feel about the church. I try to be a normal person and a good person. And that's basically what the church teaches. The church teaches that, uh, families are important, which that's, that's something that I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Check. Um, it teaches that personal, you know, self-discipline, health, uh, hygiene, those are important. I believe that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you start going down the list of things that the church and the gospel teaches and the real core values, there's nothing in there that you can make fun of. Well, one of the things I noticed, uh, because I come from the world, popular YouTuber, I've traveled the world. I come from just living life for the world, right? Yeah. So when I started going, I was like, I've heard so much crap about this church. And to this day, I think we've been there over three years. I haven't seen any of that. I haven't seen any of that. I, we show up, we hear about how wonderful Jesus Christ is, and they teach family values, and we go home. Yep. I don't know anything about all these, these you don't need to know. these pokes that the church gets. I haven't seen it. Right. I have a wonderful time with my family, and we go home feeling good. Right. Um, so that's my side of it. And that's what it's all about. The gospel is perfect. The church isn't. And mm -hmm. when I say the church, I mean its members. So there's a lot of people in there that, are a lot, that have done a lot of stupid things, just like in any religion. Wow. You're going to have bad eggs and you're going to have people that take it too far this way or too far wow. that way. But if you dive in and anybody who is is like curious about like who we are and if we're in a cult and if we have multiple wives, yeah. set all that stuff aside for a second. You can still be concerned or curious about that or whatever, but set that aside and dive into the core beliefs of the church of Jesus Christ and yeah. see if any of those resonate with you. Odds are most people feel this way, unless you, unless you believe in a completely different deity or, you know, type of being that way. But it helps me feel more hopeful. Mm. It helps me feel like I have more sense of purpose. Like I have a, I have a reason to be here. I'm not just here on this big circle, just, you know, mm -hmm. running in circles. Um, and most importantly, it creates a foundation that my family can build off of. I don't want to, and this is something that you're probably doing with your kids too, is you're creating this foundational belief that you're not forcing them to believe, but you're giving them something that they can bite off in little, in little pieces and start to understand and build their own belief or understanding of a higher being. Mm. And um, I think a lot of people think that, you know, the church gets associated with cults a lot. And cults force people to believe things or they trick people into believing things. You'll never go into a sacrament meeting like what we go to and feel like anybody's trying to trick you into believing anything. It's a bunch of amateur church members giving the, the talks. There's no preacher That's one there. of my favorite part, by the way. Yeah. Nobody works for the church. Nobody's, you're not paying a preacher. Yep. Like, why is mm -hmm. the guy preaching? Right. <laughs> he's getting paid, dude. Well, he's, <laughs> the reason why is because he's amping people up. Yeah. I love a good Christian church. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm going to some of these, I these colorful, loud yeah. churches. Mm -hmm. It is fun and you feel excited. But um, I think a lot of times people confuse that excitement for feeling a deep, profound connection with God yeah. because they're excited. Yeah. You know, your heart grates up. You're yeah. doing that kind of stuff. So that's why you won't hear clapping in, in our church. You won't hear a lot of loud I want to clap. Sometimes. So do I. I want to clap. And you know, my favorite is when you go to Polynesian wards. Um, Polynesian Mormons are like, they're very they're just loud and boisterous and fun. And you'll hear clapping. And it's just, that's nice. but it's not irreverent. I it's like done that. in a reverent way. I love it. Yeah, it's, I like it's, that. It's, it's, it's ultimately... It's all about your relationship with God yep. and the way that you 
show God and yourself to other people. That's it. Yeah. That's the only thing that you should be taking away from religion. There's a lot of things that you can learn about the Bible, about prophets, about all these different things. But at the end of the day, all of that is just ancillary information to helping you understand that you need to have a very good relationship with God. And the best way to have that is by turning to him and trying to learn how to talk to him. Yeah. Right? Well, like, did you ever pray before you became a member of the church? I did. Yeah, I did. I prayed most of my life. I remember being a little kid praying on my couch. Yeah. Yeah, so I've always had that. I've always had the belief. Right. Not like a wonder. Like I always know. With I've always known. Right. Like, um, man, I don't even know where to go with it. Have you Have you gone to the temple? Or no, not yet? Yeah, I have. Oh, you have? Yeah, we have. Oh, yeah. awesome. That's cool. Yeah, it, it's very, it's just been something personal. We have, uh, it has helped our life a lot. Yeah. It really has. Yeah. Like I've got nothing but love for it. Again, I don't push it on nobody. It's just something that we do and right. we enjoy. And I just still haven't seen any of this it's negativity. Not, I haven't seen it. It's not there. Unless you've never been there. I don't know. If you go looking for it, you can find it. Um, and you yeah, can I find it in, in, in any church member. Well, not any church, church member, but you can find it in these different, especially in Utah where that's like a, you know, epicenter of, yeah. of LDS people. You'll see... You know, when you have that many neighbors who all believe the same thing, eventually you kind of start, you know, rubbing each other the wrong way. And that's where these kind of inter interchurch conflicts and different arguments and, and ex Mormon culture starts to come from. Mm. See, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, dude. And you know, I show too. up with my family. We have a beautiful time. You're go. living the gospel the way that I wish God that's wanted, how. I wish that's it. how it could happen. Well, it's like what you guys were saying earlier. Charity makes you feel good, and the church only teaches you how to be more charitable, how to help your fellow men. It's a, mm -hmm. You, to be a good person and to make the world a better place. And yeah. that's all, all it's really about. When I first started going, a guy stood up in a meeting and he said, even if all this is a lie, you know, the Bible, Book of Mormon, even if it's a lie, it teaches you to be a better human. Yeah. yeah right? right? Even if it's all fake. Yeah. It teaches you to be a better human. Exactly. Teach you how to care for your children and your wife and raise them. And, and if it makes you feel that way, how could it possibly be wrong? Man, it would be strategic to lie yeah. about that whole Bible. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's the way I view it is I, so I go to church every Sunday that I can. I don't yeah. go every Sunday. I'm not, uh, I'm not hard on myself if I don't go. Yeah. Um, I just know that I have to have a relationship with, with God and I have to, if I don't have that, life seems meaningless. It seems really hard to know why I'm even doing what I'm doing. Because sure. if, if none of this means anything, um, What's the point? What's the why? point? And 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 feeling like there is no point. Like I'm the type of guy if I feel trapped and I don't feel like there's a bigger goal or a bigger thing in mind that I can achieve next, um, it's really hard for me. Mm. It's really really hard for me, and that's why the the church is is so great because not only do I just hope and think that maybe there's something bigger beyond what we're doing here, but I know it, yep. and I know it because, um, it's, dude, the, the coolest thing about what God has given all of us, and it doesn't matter what God you believe in, is the ability to talk to Him whether it's out loud or mm -hmm. in your head. Dude, mm -hmm. I, I constantly, I probably pray a hundred times a day. I pray constantly. I, I, when I leave yeah. the house, I pray for my family. Everything's good. I when I jump on the plane, when I jump on the helicopter. Every time we get in the helicopter, I pray. <laughs> yeah. Without fail. Good and time. That's yeah. one oh, thing. Good just time. A thank you at the end, all that. We yeah. actually try to, before we do anything major, as far as a trip or a, a event that we're working on or filming or something, we try to do a group prayer with everybody. And uh, you'll see how people who, who aren't either believers or members of the church or whatever, they, they feel a sense of like calm and comfort and they know like, okay, if these guys are stopping this chaotic operation to ask for protection and peace and comfort, that, that's a good thing. Yeah, I love that. That's a good thing. Yeah. And so um, whether you're a member, doesn't matter what, you know, what church you're a member yeah. of, I think it's just important to, I think, it, I think it's really cool to think of people that have never prayed before and, and think of their experience. Like mm -hmm. let's say somebody's listening to this and they've yeah. never prayed before and they're Absolutely. like, they're like all right, I'll try the cold shower and I'll try talking to that God guy. Yeah. <laughs> and then they roll into it and they're do like- Do that. Dude, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> do like, that. Do that. Give it a shot. Yeah. Embarrass yourself. Maybe by the time you're done praying, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm an idiot. That was dumb. Yeah. But maybe, just maybe, there's there's something bigger that can be had there and yeah. uh, you have nothing to lose. It doesn't cost anything. You might laugh at yourself, but you also might find meaning to life. Yeah. Which it's is- interesting. You know. I think it's a blessing if you if you get to see that, right? See what? Uh, a lot of people 1,000% believe opposite of what we believe. Right. Right. And I think it's a blessing to believe. 
It's a huge. I think blessing. that's a gift. It's a huge blessing because I don't it, think everybody gets the gift. It's the, it's dude. It's a blessing of hope. Yeah. It's it, being able to have hope is a big big deal. There's a lot of people in my life that have great life, right? But I know what they're missing, right? And I can't hand it to them. No. And I can't give them the joy I've had uh, by finding it, right? And you can't give it to them. You can't hand it to them. Yeah. It has to be very personal. I just, I really admire what you've done, you and your wife, obviously. You guys you guys are a great living example of what God intended uh, the gospel to be, which is you love each other, you love your kids, you love your family, you're trying to spend time together as a family unit, and you're trying to do the best you can, um, and you're, and you're, you're doing hard things to, to become better every day. You're living that on a very public level, and bro, that's changing lives. I mean, yeah. the fact that you guys were willing to come out and even talk about becoming members of the church. When I, I'm telling you, I just found out about you guys being members a, a few podcast. weeks ago, yeah. and it was just like when I text you, I'm like, bro, my mind is blown right now because uh, that's a big thing to come out and announce, especially for somebody. It's one thing for a kid to grow up in it and then become, you know, high profile. Yeah. It's another thing for a guy to have millions and millions of eyeballs on him and say. This is this is us. This is what we're doing. Yeah. It's very powerful yeah. and it's very uh, important that you do that. And it's not important that you convert people to the church. It's important that you show people that no matter how weird it may be or how people may look at you, it's important for you that wow. people understand that <clears throat> this is your belief and it's something that makes you happy. So share it. And yeah. it's not none of what they're going to learn if they dig deep into what you're doing is going to make them a, a worse person. Yeah. It's only gonna. It only has the potential to bring happiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm proud of it, and I I'm love I'm, it. and I'm and I'm can't deny the happiness. Right. Can't deny the joy. Can't, can't deny, deny the, the light that, that we can't see deny. in you. It yeah. can't deny any of it. Right. Cannot. If I did, that would be a problem. I can't deny it. So, yeah, man. If I give anybody anything, that's fantastic. Love it. That's powerful stuff. It's just yeah. I admire what you guys did. It's it's not easy, and I know you guys didn't do it for any other reason. You had no motivation and no no motive to do it other than I'm just proud. Yeah, just proud of it and just yeah. makes you happy. And Whatever. it's you, me. But yeah, it's you. I ain't trying to hide me. No, that's the I'm whole. That's, a, I'm on camera, <laughs> dude. I'm not trying to hide me. That's just what it's cool watching from an outsider looking in. You know, you're hitting these different benchmarks and chapters in your life. Yes, and uh, you're you're not necessarily closing doors. You're just you accomplished that. And you're moving up that that ladder, and I think people are are. I know personally, as somebody who consumes your content, I am riding that wave with you because it's so cool to watch. It's awesome because very rarely do you see people that you look up to continue to progress. Mm. Yeah, a lot of them just kind of either plateau or, unfortunately, some go backwards because oh. they hit success and they don't know what to do with it. And I, I think that's one thing that the church helps with the town is helping you stay level headed when you do become successful. People don't realize that there's a lot of very, very wealthy members of the church. The Mormon church probably has the highest population of very wealthy people. And it's no coincidence. It's not the church gives them money. It's these people are hardworking, disciplined, and they've learned that, that basically being abundant and sharing what they have with others comes back tenfold. Yeah. And it's just the, it's the way it goes. So yeah. you don't have to be Mormon to get that. You just you don't be a good huh? person to share what you have and watch what happens. I love it, man. Wow. Uh, do you want to wrap this up? I feel like that's yeah. solid. Yeah, that, that was good, man. I, was I, cool. I need to know in the comments if, you, if you've if you made it the full two plus hours. You got to <laughs> leave. What should be the word in the comment section? What should it be? <laughs> I'll end up saying something that'll get you uh, canceled. So... <laughs> yeah, you make, if you make it the full three hours or whatever we got here, I, I, I just just comment keep on, school keep on, bus. I keep on going to, to just work. comment school bus. That'll be so random. People will be like, "What school bus? Like school bus, dude." I like then we'll it. Know. We'll know yeah. you made it all the way. Or where's Brittany? Where's Brittany? Bring Brittany back. <laughs> That's the comment. Hashtag Where's Brittany? If you've watched this whole thing, <laughs> the, the problem with that one is there's gonna be those before they've made yeah. it three hours. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be. <laughs> Get this random other short yeah. kid off and bring Brittany back. Well, thanks for having us, dude. Honestly, you're Thank doing you. you're doing bigger work than you. I think you guys even realize, both of you, the whole team. It's cool to watch. Appreciate that. Thank you for making the trip, the red eye all night, just to be here. I uh, hope you guys are lifted, inspired, and uh, just feel a little better, ready to take on your day, ready to take on your week. Go get it. It's not just going to come to you. Go get it. We love you. You're beautiful. You're one of a kind. Smile more. Yeah. Oh. Hey, that's our longest episode yet. Yeah. I love that. Good luck with editing. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he'll have it done by tonight. Ha <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, by the time you cut out the garbage van, it's still probably two.